Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Now you can tell why it took three years to make this retrospective. <laughs> we cannot even get the microphones. But um, no, I'm kidding. Um, it took three years because Carl made over 2,000 sculptures and I don't know, 4,000 poems and a couple hundred of those odd objects that are in the Dada Forgeries room. So yeah, it was a long journey to get here tonight, uh, today. And um, well, my name is Jasmine Raymond. I am the curator of DIA Foundation. And with Philippe Verne, who used to be the director of DIA, we co-curated the retrospective that is upstairs. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the serious and pivotal work that assistant curator Manuel, Manuel Sirauki has done alongside with the curatorial associate Megan Whitko, our Mellon Fellow Andriana Campbell, and our interns Tim Anderson and Francesca Logalvo, who coordinated today's program. I must give also additional thanks to our colleagues Blair Babcock, Patrick Hellman, Max Tanon, Kathleen Anderson, and Susan Sari Patton for their supporting role in realizing today's um, program and tomorrow's program. So like I said, it took four, now today is four years since we began this journey of imagining a retrospective of the work of Carl Andre. At the beginning, um, we were motivated to conceive a presentation of his work that would allow us to see the logic of Carl's thinking, but also to be accurate and to offer you as the viewer, um, the majority of you, which we assume have only been acquainted with his work from those few pieces that are in public collections, and then from a great number of images that have been reproduced since um, the early 60s. Many of those images, black and white, many of those images often distorted. We also Im imagine this exhibition as um, really as a scratch in the surface. As I said, Carl was really prolific, and his catalog resume is in the making right now, and one day we will have the opportunity to really grasp the full production of large, but also an enormous amount of very small-scale works which were, were impossible to exhibit here um, in a museum context, given to the security issues that it presents. Um, so we look forward to that publication um, to be able to better understand um, that entire body of work which is excluded from the presentation here in Beacon. This weekend symposium is part of a series of programs um, that we conceive to generate an in-depth examination of Andres' work, his career, and which along with the publication that accompanies the exhibition um, complement the effort of the retrospective. The book, which I hope some of you have seen or maybe look at it later, um, it was an attempt to introduce new voices to the discourse of Carl's practice, and we remain indebted to Christophe Cherik, Brooke Holmes, Vincent Katz, Marjorie Perloff, Arnaud Pierre, Alistair Ryder, Anne Ronimer, Phyllis Stockman, and Mika Joshitake, who accepted our invitation to contribute to this publication. For those who are very familiar with Carl's um, the discourses around Carl's work already understand that many of these scholars and authors had never previously written about his work. And that was a conscious effort on our part to expand the conversation um, as we're doing today and since May by providing a, a variety of public programs, which this symposium is just one of many. Um, since May, we benefited from the insightful research of a number of other scholars, including the mathematician Philip Orden, the novelist Aaron Peck, poet Vincent Katz, and additionally to Manuel Sirauki's last lecture on the Dada forgeries, we had the artist Leslie Hewitt conduct um, one of the uh, famous artists on artists lecture series in the city. And in the spring, we'll have um, Stephen Hoban speaking on Carl's 
use of Greek mythology in his work, and Pierre Laguillon, the artist, also coming to examine this contested territory of photography and the documentation of Carl's work. Lastly, we're enormously proud of bringing together today's authors and scholars, Professor Anna Che, Linda Morris, which will be followed tomorrow by Mark Godfrey and Professor James Mayer. We begin organizing this program and we were guided by a genuine desire to seize the opportunity of having such extraordinary works upstairs and to host under one roof a diversity of voices that could inform and perhaps update the various discourses surrounding his practice. We envision today's conversation to be extensive and engaging and we're delighted that Dia could be the host of such an exceptional event. Before I give the microphone to Manuel to introduce today's speaker, I would like to ask you to please turn off your cell phones. Um, this lecture is being recorded for the purpose of Dia's archive, and should you want a copy of, this, of the audio or the video, you just have to reach out to me or Manuel and we'll make it available. So thank you. So, um, good morning again. Uh, welcome uh, on behalf of DIA and all of us uh, to this Carl Anders Symposium. Um, thank you, Yasmir, for your introduction. I will just give you a few keys for today's um, uh, development of events. We will have uh, Professor Linda Morris uh, speak out Carl Andre uh, in, uh, in the context of, uh, of, of this uh, very important six years, 67-73. Then we'll have a lunch break, and then we'll have Professor Anna Chafe again speak uh, on the work calendar, and then we will have a panel discussion, and uh, hopefully we'll have still some minutes to uh, see the show again for those who will not return tomorrow. Um, there will be time for lunch, time for coffee, um, but um, remember to keep your chips, because although it doesn't seem so, the, actually we have a full house today, apparently people are taking the, the train that arrives at 11.30, um, so the room should be filling in and the chairs are limited. And um, yeah, I, I can just welcome you uh, to this symposium and welcome Professor Linda Morris, who uh, was uh, so kind to come from London um, to speak here today. Um, uh, I think many of you are familiar with the figure and the work of, of Linda Morris. Uh, she uh, had a beautiful uh, presentation recently at Artist Space in New York, documenting Cadere. Um, she has been a close collaborator of all the artists that pretty much is working on, and that's, I think, a, a very uh, interesting difference between her as a scholar and other scholars that have not been uh, part of the game. She was, I mean, very impressively, I was reading uh, the other day, she was at the art school, uh, the final school in Dusseldorf when Joseph Boyce was being dismissed. Uh, so, and uh, she was part of all that, and I think it's really an honor for all of us to have her um, here today. So just to give you the, the official language about Professor Linda Morris' work, she's a, a professor of curatorial studies and art history at Norwich University of the Arts in Norfolk, uh, United Kingdom, and has been the curator of the open submission exhibition East International since 1991. In 2014, she organized Genuine Conceptualism, 1969-1976, an exhibition at the Herbert Foundation in Ghent, Belgium, that was accompanied by the publication of a compilation of her research on the subject since the late uh, 1960s, and that's the book where you will find the famous Joseph Boyce episode. Um, and I will also mention, of course, her uh, work uh, on the book Unconcealed uh, that you will see at the bookshop, uh, uh, an extraordinary volume on the networks of conceptual art in the 70s. She also recently curated the traveling exhibition documenting Cadere, 1972-1978, um, exhibited in 2012 and 13. Her writing on Carl Andre includes such historical contributions as a 1975 interview and a review of Andre's uh, 1978 exhibition at Whitechapel Gallery in London. So um, please join me welcoming uh, Professor Lina Morris to Dia. Okay, yeah, good. Is 
Is this turned on? Yeah. This lecture concentrates on the 68 Carl Andre exhibitions that took place mainly in Northern Europe between 1967 and 1973. It will also look at the question of why North European dealers and museums were so receptive to US minimalist and conceptual artists, and also to artists from the UK. This is uh, the book Unconcealed. I would like to acknowledge my late PhD student, Sophie Richard, whose ability with French, German, and Dutch languages enabled her to piece together, alongside my memories, a PhD that I edited and titled Unconcealed um, in the year following her death. Um, another, Sophie built on the work of Catherine Mosley and her exhibition Conception, the Conceptual Document, 68 to 72. Um, I went to work at the ICA in London in July 1969, and I went on to set up their first bookshop. The first installation I worked on in August 69 was When Attitudes Become Form. This is the ICA catalog, which you don't see often. You usually see the Byrne catalog. And the leaflet for it with uh, Victor Bergen's silver Xerox path. And this is the Byrne catalog with the live in your head, which we didn't use in London. The review by Seyman's ex-assistant, Jean-Christophe Armand, uh, in Art International in May 1969, called the exhibition a perfect summary of the spade work achieved by the progressive European galleries, Conrad Fischer in Dusseldorf, Ricke and Schwerner in Cologne, Heine Friedrich in Munich, Speroni in Turin, and Wide White Space in Antwerp, and Sonnebend in Paris. This is Zeman's book of his archived documents, 67 to 70, with a cover of his photographs of the When Attitudes Become Form installation in Bern. The first document in Zeman's book of his archive is the invitation card to Conrad Fischer's first exhibition, which was the exhibition of Carl Andre's work. Seyman wrote to Conrad in late 1968, asking for names and addresses for his first visit to New York. There was also correspondence between Seyman and Conrad, checking the value of works in When Attitudes Become Form uh, from the 2nd of February, 1969. Uh, Harold Seyman writes to Conrad Fisher, the Sandback value is Deutschmarks 2,400, Andre Deutschmarks 1000 and Ryman Deutschmarks 3200. Uh, Conrad replies to Harold Zeman, Sambach 2800, Andre Deutschmarks 10,000, um, and Ryman 3600. In the 14th of April, Conrad thanks Zeman for arranging the Sambach sale and the Ryman possible sale. This is Charles Harrison's photograph of the ICA installation in 69. Conrad Fisher was there all week during the installation and he did much more of the installation than Charles Harrison, who is credited with the ICA showing. I received a number of international phone calls for Conrad in the gallery office where I worked with the boys of the installation crew. Harold Zeman arrived just in time to make his speech at the opening. Zeman was working on the Fluxus exhibition and the book for the Kunsthalle in Cologne at the time. And that was his area of specialism, not conceptual art. At the ICA opening, I remember watching Conrad meeting Gilbert and George for the first time in the foyer with metallic paint on their hands and faces. 
Charles Harrison had excluded them from the showing. All three were shy and awkward. I do not remember Carl being there. I think he certainly wasn't there. There was a party after the opening at Charles Harrison's house in Islington, where Conrad was staying. The boys at the ICA installation crew, who installed When Attitudes Become Form, became the regular roadies for the Rolling Stones, a wonderful cultural coincidence. Uh, the Eagle on the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square. The Stones released Street Fighting Man in November 1968, after the personal experience of Jagger at the Grosvenor Square demonstration in front of the US Embassy against the war in Vietnam in March 1968, with the concrete eagle on top of the building. As they sang, everywhere I hear the sound of marching, think the time is right for a palace revolution. There's some rather grainy photographs of the Venice Biennale demonstration published in Studio International in September 1968, and a further image of the Milan Triennale in May 68. Demonstrators against the war in Vietnam at the Milan Triennale and the Venice Biennale, and also at Documenta 4. Art and Arsis tells us that Giulio Le Parc held banners proclaiming, what remains for the artists of a nation that wages such a criminal war as that in Vietnam, but to make minimal art? <clears throat> Atelier Populaire poster that I actually collected in, from the walls in Paris in June 68. Vietnam was French Indochina until 1954. May 68 was also connected with the protests against the Vietnam War. I was at the Maison Franco-Britannique in June 68, doing research on Gustave Moreau. Um, Cécile reminds us of the anti-Vietnam War sentiment amongst US artists through the IS Servicemen's Fund. I recommend you watch the Winter Soldiers Conference filmed over three days in Detroit at this time, where US soldiers uh, explained their experience in Vietnam, some of the horrors that they had seen. <coughs> I haven't got a pointer, but uh, the little bit of Northern Europe near the United Kingdom I want to talk in particular about that little triangle. In my introduction to Unconcealed, I defined the idea that most, but not all, of the European dealer galleries, curators, collectors, and museums that made early exhibitions of conceptual art all centered on the triangle of Northern Europe between Dusseldorf, Cologne, Amsterdam, Dusseldorf and Cologne, Amsterdam, and Brussels, Ghent. If we look at a satellite picture of um, the whole of Europe, you can see how brightly lit, the brightest lit area of the whole of Europe is that little triangle. Um, and that's because it is the most industrial part of Europe. This triangle in Northern Europe, I've also begun to realize, was the site of some of the worst street fighting and aerial bombardment by the British and American forces of northern Germany in the last months of World War II. The people who established the movement called Conceptual Art had witnessed that street fighting and bombing as children. Conrad Fischer was born in 1939. He was six years old in 1945. He once taught at a breakfast with Gilbert and George that he loved soft white English bread toasted because it reminded him of the food the English soldiers gave him as a child. Um, <clears throat> the capitalist realist group with Conrad, who as an artist called himself by his mother's name, Conrad Lug. In 1967, Germany had been divided between East and West, between communism and capitalism for 22 years. 
Conrad worked closely with Polk and Richter in Capitalist Realism, um, a, a play on socialist realism. Polk came to the West from East Germany as a child, and Richter came to Dusseldorf in the 1960s after studying at Dresden Academy. In an interview published in Studio International in March 1971, Conrad reminded readers that Germany still had a problem, an inferiority complex to overcome. He said his job was to get artists over here and to bring them into contact with those who live here. When I was an artist, everything was so far away. Walhol, Liechtenstein, all those were great, unobtainable men. But when you know them, you can have a beer with them and get rid of your inferiority complex. Palermo and Richter, for example, two of the German artists who've exhibited with me, have now been to New York, and they felt at home there because they'd already met artists like Andre and Lewitt over here. Conrad used to tell the story of taking the capitalist realist work to Paris in early 1967 to show Iliana Sonnebend. He explained they were German pop artists, and this made Iliana double up in hysterics at the idea of German pop art, and she dropped all the work on the floor. Let us now start to pick our way through the list of Carl andre exhibitions in Europe between 67 and 73 after this introduction. Please excuse my images, simple snaps taken from books, catalogues, and invitation cards, the pieces of paper in my own and other people's archives. This is the Paul Mainz poster. The starting point has to be serial formation in Frankfurt in May, June, 1967. Um, organized by Paul Mainz and the studio gallery J.W. Goethe at the University in Frankfurt. A group exhibition included on works by André Dibitz, Flavin, Hacker, Judd, Lewitt, Conrad, Lug, and Richard Long in May, June 1967. I'm using quite a lot the photographs of Jacques Charlier, who spent a year in 1974 photographing all the characters of the European art world. Um, and Mainz worked as an art director for Young and Rubicon in Frankfurt, and then in New York in 65 to 67. Then again, back in Frankfurt. His gallery in Cologne didn't open until 71, and by that time, the US artists were mostly with other dealers and galleries. Inspired by Mainz's exhibition and a challenge to start a gallery by the Dusseldorf dealer, Alfred Schmäler, Conrad wrote to Caspar Koenig, who was living in New York, the 8th of July, 1967. I'm planning big things. I'm opening a dealer gallery in September. I have already the space, very beautiful. I've heard that you will come in September to Europe with Robert Morris and another artist. And here I want to kindly ask you to speak with Bob Morris and to convince him to do something in the gallery Conrad Fisher. I absolutely want to do a progressive gallery and I have the highest ambition that an outstanding artist like Robert Morris opens my gallery. I'm further interested in Carl Andre, Donald Judd, Solowit and Agnes Martin. Conrad's first exhibition in Neubuchstrasse, New Bridge Street, space was Carl Andre. Conrad rented a covered alleyway between two buildings and had distinctive glass doors made for the front and the back. Carl's first one-man exhibition in Europe from the 20th of October to the 28th of November, 1967. was in the Dusseldorf Altstadt, the old town between the Kunstakademie and the Kunsthalle and Kunstverein. Conrad did not show Robert Morris until February, March 1973. In August 1967, André sent Conrad a drawing for the exhibition specifying steel with 90 degree right angle L-shaped pieces, but this was not carried out. 
The opening was a big party. Boyce was standing on the Andre. Everyone was walking, feet on the Andre. There was no space to do anything except to walk on the Andre. And there's a romantic image from that period in the archives in Dusseldorf of Conrad and Carl, each holding a rose. The Andre invitation card for October 1967, Conrad credits himself, whether it's true or not, with being the first dealer gallery to use postcards, which were cheaper to post than an envelope in those days. The Andre invitation opened out, it was double-sided, um, in the proportion of the Neubruckstrasse space. The inside left, um, with Carl's CV, 1966 simply says the Jewish Museum, New York, and was a reference to Kinister McShine's primary structures exhibition, but in the context of Dusseldorf, it has loaded connotations. The other side of Carl's CV, from Carl's CV, gives the date and title of the work as Ontologis Plastique, which I'd never heard used again. Acknowledges the work was made by um, Technisch Aus, I'm sorry, my German isn't terribly good, um, in, in Dusseldorf, one of the uh, they had also made the doors for Conrad's Neubuchstrasse space that year. Dusseldorf is Germany's steel city. It's famous for its steel. And this company may have been connected with Mannesmann. Um, the Edinburgh artist Alan Johnson, who showed with Conrad in 1974 and was living in Germany at that time, once told me that Conrad's father was a director of the Steel Corporation, Mannesmann. I do not know if this is true. I met Conrad's mother, but, I never, but he, Conrad never ever talked about his father. I started to wonder if this exhibition was the first Andre flat metal floor piece made out of square tiled shapes. It's also difficult to establish how many Outstadt pieces were made for that October 67 exhibition. Um, the Herbig Munich catalogue in 73, who was one of the purchasers, has this drawing uh, illustrated in it for Andre's 100 steel pieces, 1967, showing five variations of 100 pieces of steel. One times 100, two times 50, uh, five times 20, which is the one that Conrad installed, and then a 10 by 10 square. And it says that it's for Conrad Fisher, the 30th of October, 1967, and shows the, the series of five sculptures made from steel plates, each 50 by 50 centimeters and five millimeters thick. Whether the drawing was made with the intention that if collectors came, new pieces could be subsequently made. Um, in the Studio International interview in 1971, Conrad says, things don't sell all that fast anyway. Although if I hadn't sold anything at the Andre show, I shouldn't have got much further. The first collectors were a Dutch couple, the Vissers. The Vissers piece was shown in the exhibition Three Blind Mice. Um, at the Stedelijk van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven. Um, it's only a tiny little reproduction, but I thought it was worth showing. Um, it was three collectors, the Vizers, the Peters, and Brecht, and it traveled to Ghent St. Peters. The exhibition catalog shows Carl Andre's square piece for Mia and Martin Visser, 1967. A 100-part floor sculpture purchased from Conrad Fischer, Dusseldorf, 1967. The catalogue of the Visser collection, now in the Kroler Muller Museum in Otterloh in Holland, says the Visser's 
commissioned a work to be made um, by, um, by Kirk in Nabato Company. It was made of 100 pieces of hot rolled iron measuring 200 by 200 centimeters. That would make each piece 20 by 20 centimeters as opposed to the original 50 by 50 centimeters steel sculpture. A second Andre piece was also in the, the same exhibition catalog as belonging to Fritz and Agnes Brecht, um, a collection, uh, 21 pieces of aluminium from 1967, which had been bought from the Duan Gallery in Los Angeles. Andre's exhibition in LA is usually listed uh, as before his show with Conrad, but I do not have the exact dates for it. This suggests that Andre was working on floor pieces with metal, but not on the steel squares in 67 of his Outstadt piece. So what do we know about the five Outstadt works, each of 100 squares? A 100-part square sculpture dated 1967 and titled Outstadt was bought by the curator Franz Meyer, who was frustrated by the Kunstmuseum Basel Committee's refusal to accept his advice to buy an Andre. The director personally acquired Carl Andre's 10 by 10 Outstadt Square in 67, a 100 part sculpture from Heine Friedrich at the first Basel Art Fair in 1970. Mayer finally persuaded Basel to acquire the work in 1974. This is um, the 5 by 20 Outstadt rectangle Dusseldorf 67, bought by Giuseppe Panza and installed in his Palazzo. And Panza bought it in 1974. The Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam also acquired Carl Andre's 10 by 10 Outstadt lead square, dated 1967 stroke 1976, a 100 part sculpture purchased from Conrad Fischer in Dusseldorf in 1976 for $64,000. This was a lead sculpture, not steel, properly manufactured around the date of purchase by the Dutch Bergeit Company of the Vissers. Now I want to raise again the question of whether Conrad's Dusseldorf exhibition may have been Andre's first square metal floor sculpture, with a question mark. Was it the first of the classic series of metal floor sculptures that were to cover the floor of the Guggenheim three years later? To carpet the floor of the Guggenheim three years later. But there's one US contender for the title. Um, 64 Steel Square, New York, 1967, hand rolled steel, a 64 unit square, eight by eight, um, three quarters of an inch by 64 by 64, belonging to Jan and Ingeborg van der Mark, a Dutch curator at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1967, when the Museum of, uh, who, and he then went to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. In the touring exhibition catalogue, Carl Andre Sculptures 59 to 77, David Borden tells us, one of the artist's early works in a square format, this sculpture is also flatter than most of its antecedents. Andre's first large metal floor piece consists of steel plates already cut into squares, which he purchased from a salvage company on Canal Street in downtown Manhattan. But I've been unable to find any further details on whether it comes before the planning and the carried out with Conrad Fisher or after. Uh, so it'd be an interesting piece of research for one of the young historians here. Carl Andre told Brigitte Cole in her book in, on Conrad, Okie Dokie, Conrad Fisher, in an interview held in 2002, published in 2010, I think Heine Friedrich and Annie de Decker shared the cost of bringing me to Dusseldorf. This is certainly true of the exhibitions with Heine Friedrich, um, which is the 13th of the 2nd to the 8th of um, March 
68, Heine had a, a group show, and then later he showed this steel roll, steel row in Munich, and that was March, April 1968, after the group exhibition. This is Andre's drawing for Friedrich in Munich. The gallery also produced a diagram for the installation. And there is a, a, an installation shot of the work in Friedrich's gallery. Conrad's archive has an invoice to Heine Friedrich dated February, March 68 for work, transport and flights on Andre and Lewitt exhibitions that they worked together. There's a note in Conrad's archive from Annie de Decker of Wide White Space, dated the 12th of December, 1967, to Conrad simply saying, thank you for the Andre exhibition. Another of these lovely photographs, which I used in Unconcealed of um, Jacques Chalier, uh, I think it's a very revealing photo of the relationship between Conrad Fisher, Annie de Decker, and Benjamin Buchlow looking on in 1974. Charlier photographed the North European art world at all its gatherings throughout the year 74, and it was shown at the Palais de Beaux Arts in January 75 alongside the Onkawara retrospective. Document 4 in 1968 has two volumes a red and a blue catalogue. The earliest surviving letter from Carl to Conrad is dated the 13th of February, 1968, and says, everything sounds great. Copenhagen, Antwerp, Dusseldorf, The Hague. I've been invited to document a four in Castle. Is this good? Question mark. Do, do you mind taking care of all my business in Europe? If you approve, you could tell the document of four people when I'm coming. I depend entirely on your advice in these matters. You will be very welcome here in New York. Many fine artists wish to show you their work. I've told them you're a fine fellow, an artist and not a stuffy dealer. This is uh, the entry, which you probably can't read very clearly, of, um, in the Document of Four catalog. And the image, supplied by John Weber at Duan, confirms that in less than a year after the Outstadt series, the steel, square steel sculptures had become the identifiable image of a classic Andre. In October 1967, while he was in Dusseldorf for his first show, Andre made this drawing proposing a second series of four pieces, which come to be known as the Hague series, for the exhibition at the Hague uh, of 36 squares, again in five formations in Dusseldorf steel. This must have been for the Minimal Art Gimente Museum at the Hague, which was from the 23rd of March to the 26th of May, 1968 curated by Eno Develing, who may have visited Andre's show in Dusseldorf. The, hey, the catalog introduction by Develing um, is very interesting and should be much better known. And also Lucy Lepard wrote um, a six page essay on minimalism and Carl Andre had a brief CV and also published one of his poems. Um, the 20th to the 29th of September 1968 was the first of the series of prospect exhibitions at the Stedelijk Kunsthalle in Dusseldorf, which had a catalogue that was simply a newspaper. Andre's name is featured on the cover and on the Duan pages, uh, where the names of the artists that they were going to show. Those photographs exist of the press conference in Dusseldorf. Uh, Conrad Fisher is the guy with his head tilted in glasses, and he runs through the other images. 
and he was uh, the co-organizer, but the key person in the series of prospect shows. There's also an image of the press conference at the bottom. Um, and these are a couple of installation shots of what that Prospect 68 exhibition looked like. Um, it was within a couple of months of the end of Documenta 4, where there'd only been uh, four minimal artists in the exhibition. Um, the big igloo in the front is Mario Mert's General Geip igloo, with the quote from the commander of the North Vietnamese forces in neon on top of the igloo, which was brought by Ileana Sonnaben to the exhibition. Um, Prospect was in competition with the uh, Kunstmarkt in Cologne, which had started the year before, uh, but it was the idea of doing an exhibition rather than stands uh, like a typical art fair. Germany is all very closely related to a small group of people at this time. Um, you have Jürgen Hartens, secretary of Documenta 4, writing to Conrad about Karl Andre concerning the agreement to show at Documenta 4. Conrad replies to Hartens the same day, suggesting that Andre should be invited to make an outdoor sculpture for Documenta 4. Jürgen Hartens later moved from Kassel to Dusseldorf to become the direct, deputy director of the Kunsthalle in 1969. His secretary was Renata Sharp, the ex-wife of Willoughby Sharp. And you have this sense of this very closely interrelated group of people in Germany at that time. This was Dutch company started to make Andre's work for Conrad. An invoice dated the 25th of October 1968 uh, to Conrad for Carl Andre 64 zinc plates, one centimeter thick by 24 by 24 centimeters. Uh, and it cost 1,996 Deutschmarks, which at that time was uh, $370. The date suggests that this was probably the manufacture of a work by Carl Andre for the Mönchengladbach exhibition. And this is the famous, Mönchengladbach is virtually a, 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 a suburb of uh, Dusseldorf. Uh, and this is the famous box. Uh, the exhibition was uh, 1968, the 18th of October to the 15th of December. And this was Carl's first one man museum exhibition. And Mönchengladbach is virtually a suburb of Dusseldorf. Um, and you get this text by Karl, a man climbs a mountain because it's there. A man makes a work of art because it's not there. Some correspondence about this exhibition survives in Conrad's archive. Uh, Conrad wrote to Karl Andre the 11th of July, 68. Dr. Cladders is at the museum since last year. I think this small museum is becoming more and more important and now well known in Europe and famous for its extraordinary catalogues. It would be good to show some early pieces which you could rebuild there. Perhaps it should be a small retrospective of yours. Cladders will make a catalogue for your show. The catalogues are always in a box. I also send you a plan of the rooms. And the 20th of July, Carl replies to Conrad, thanks for your letter and plans for Mönchengladbach. I met Dr. Cladders in Castle uh, at the Document of Four. I remember being through his town. I want to do the show very much. There's a lot of images of this box, which if anybody wants to go back through them later, we can do it at lunchtime. It's in the show, so you can see it there. I didn't need to. Uh, but he asks himself the questions, and it's a very beautiful piece. And that's the sack at the end. Studio International Minimalism Special Issue was edited by Barbara Rice in March 69. I just say there's a great row over the cover. Uh, both Barbara and... Um, 
Peter Townsend, for some reason, weren't around when the final catalogue went to uh, issue went to press, and their well-trusted designer thought it was just too boring in black and white, and he coloured it in in turquoise, and uh, it caused an enormous row. The US minimal sculptors were showing in galleries and mixed exhibitions with dealers and in small North European museums alongside a group of European artists working with cultural memories. Jan Dibitz, Richard Long, Daniel Buren, Art and Language, Mario Matz, Gilbert and George, and eventually Marcel Brodhaus joined them with his Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles, 1968 to 71. The minimal painters, with the exception of Ryman, did not show much in Europe until prospect painting in 1973. In this issue, uh, edited by Barbara Rice, who'd been a Maya Shapiro student here and was from New York and knew all the artists personally, and then she came to London to do a PhD on the relationship between Turner and abstract expressionism. I think she'd been kind of slightly adopted by... Um, no, I, I won't go into all of this stuff. Um, um, yeah, but if I can just... Um, she's writing about this minimal art show and giving the list of artists that five works were exhibited by each of ten artists in this big show of minimal art. But from the 10 artists, Barbara goes on to say that to me, Andre, Flavin, Judd, LeWitt and Morris are the most conceptually interesting. By that I mean their artistic ideas seem strong and deep enough to live beyond individual phenomenological experiences of the physical world. The writings, and this is her images of the, uh, that she used in the article, the writings of Barbara Rice, the US historian living in London, are very interesting. The Tate Gallery absolutely follows Barbara's guidance in the years 67 to 73, starting with her special issue of Studio International. This is a photo booth strip of Barbara Rice snogging with Carl Andre um, in a photo booth. Barbara was a great mentor for my generation in London. She was our main contact with New York artists. The role that Jack Wendler took over, to some extent, when he opened in London in December 71. Nicholas Sirota acquired her archive for the Tate after her tragic early death in 78, but the material has never been published. Sadly, she's yet another woman ignored in favor of minor male contemporaries. Barbara did more than anyone else to bring together the US minimal sculptors and the list of European conceptualists that I've just read out. Um, the next important exhibition was Oplos Schroven at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. Um, I'm sorry, my copy was in Ghent in the exhibition and I didn't get round to getting an image for it. Um, it opened a week before when Attitudes Become Form and was curated by William Wim Behrens, and it included work by Andre. The catalogue was a loose leaf collection of drawings on graph paper, which had been sent to each of the exhibiting artists. There was public criticism of the exhibition that was discussed in an interview uh, with Bart de Beer and Salima Essenink in Art Press in a special issue in 1996. Wim Behrens left the Stedelijk within a year to teach at Groningen University. He later went on to organize Sonspec 71 and then finally came back to as director of the Boymans Museum in 78 and the Stedelijk Museum from 85. Um, after the minimal art exhibition, the, uh, sorry, uh, the Gementi Museum organized a one-man show by Carl Andre, curated by Eno Develing. Andre began the installation in June the 9th, 1969, and Develing wrote the final exhibition catalogue, which was amongst the first devoted to Andre, and that's another document I failed to find. 
Inspired by the success of their group show, the museum had begun a series of solo shows on a minimalist. Andre was chosen to be the first subject because Develing thought he'd received less attention than the other minimal artists. Things can change. The Guggenheim International Silver Box. Diane Waldman wrote to Conrad in November 69. Hans Strello suggested I contact you for, on your advice for the Guggenheim International 71 exhibition. I will be in Germany in December to see younger German artists. My list includes Joseph Boyce, Rainer Ruthenbeck, Bernton Hillebecker, Jörg Immendorf, Klaus Rink, Gerhard Richter, and Siebmark Polke. None of Waldman's original lists survived Conrad's help. Of the 21 artists in the final exhibition, 14 showed with Conrad, including Daniel Buren, Hanny Darboven, Jan Dibitz, Richard Long, Maria Mertz, Carl Andre, Solowit, Bruce Nauman, Robert Ryman, and Lawrence Wiener. Conrad, as a dealer, was more concerned with museum shows for his artists than with one-off sales to collectors. This chart, uh, which I did for Unconcealed, details in blue exhibitions that were openly curated by dealers in this period. The shows that Conrad curated are shown in red. You can see that amongst... Um, I think there's a set of issues there which are, are very pertinent to contemporary art. Uh, Sonsbeck took place um, in June, July, uh, June through to August 71 in Arnhem. And this is Andre's light wire circuit, but it's uh, labeled light wine circuit, and I think it must be a spelling mistake. It must be light wire circuit, 1971, in volume two. And uh, there were also a version of the early vector drawing in the catalog. Also in the catalog is this text at the bottom here, the June 28 text of Andre quoting Karl Marx, the contributions of labor and capital to the production process. I made an interview with Seth Seaglobe in 2004 where I was starting to prepare the P Picasso Peace and Freedom exhibition about Picasso and Marxism after 1945. And I wanted to talk about the American context with Seth and Marxism at this period. And Seth repeated several times in that interview that Andre was the most serious Marxist amongst the artists in his circle. For a few years, around 67, 73, Conrad was the major figure in the network of conceptual art in Europe. He held annual exhibitions of Andre's work and to run through some of the lovely little invitation cards. This is the first, I think, use of the periodic table in 69. Uh, four mediations on the year 1960 from the June 1970 wood pieces. And small floor pieces, and small lettering in May 72. And the dipoles from 73. Wide White Space continued to work closely with Conrad, but they closed their gallery in 1974. It's the ribbon pieces from 68. An installation view of their exhibition of young American artists. And the invitation to the exhibition of young American artists with the drawing by Bruce Nauman and the list there. Bollinger was in the show as well, Altschweger. And their big uh, poster uh, of the periodic table in 71. Uh, the weathering piece invitation, 71, and an installation shot of the weathering piece. In 19... I'm running through the different dealer galleries who were working with Andre in Europe at this point. 
Um, Yvonne Lambert wrote to Conrad in May 1969, I hear that Carl Andre is in Europe, and if there is a possibility, I would be very interested in having an exhibition here in Paris in the autumn. Could you let me know if that might be possible? Yvonne Lambert held his first Andre exhibition in 1971 in Paris through Conrad. That's just a, a, a magazine reproduction from that time. In 1972, Yvonne Lambert organized Actuality du Bilan, um, and this is an installation shot of the André with Daniel Buren getting his stripes in the window directly behind it. Um, London doesn't figure very prominently in all of this. Nicholas Logsdale, who you can see on the extreme right, um, of the Listen Gallery in London, also showed Andre in 1972 with the Sorts exhibition. This is another of the Charlier photographs with Solowit, Bernd Becker, and Logsdale. Uh, Carl Andre's Sorts exhibition at the Listen in 1972. Um, the Listen actually has a wonderful set of photographs that uh, Logsdale took himself lying on the floor looking at all these pieces of metal. And um, uh, Nicholas told me that uh, he took all the photographs himself because they simply didn't have the money and, uh, to employ a photographer to take the photographs. And um, I think he also didn't have the money to make metal pieces. And Carl had just collected these from the scrap metal yard around. And this is a detail of um, one of the sorts pieces, which was purchased by André Gumin, one of the major young collectors emerging at that time in Ghent in Belgium, which has now sadly all been sold up. The following year, 144 magnesium plates, 19, dated 1969, 144 part sculpture was purchased by the Tate from Heine Friedrich in Cologne through the Lisson Gallery in London um, in 1973 for the price of $44,000. And I think very interesting behind a lot of what I'm saying is the whole sense of percentages between dealers, which is the real story of the art world. There's an undated postcard from Spironi to Conrad Fischer asking for information about available Andre works for a collector. The postcard is filed under 1968, but as far as I can find out, Spironi held his first exhibition of Andre's work in 1973 in Turin. I, and that's a photograph of it. Um, I made this chart of exchange rates between the pound, the Deutschmark, and the dollar from 67 to 79. Currencies were extremely unstable in this period. It's probably the biggest period of instability since the 20s. Um, this was caused in part by the escalating cost of the Vietnam War and the steep increase in the price of oil caused by OPEC in the aftermath of two Arab-Israeli wars. The Deutschmark to the US dollar doubled in value over the decade and virtually tripled in value against the devalued pound sterling. I couldn't go to Germany very often anymore. <laughs> um, and this is a photograph um, made by Douglas Hubler um, of Speroni and Conrad opened a joint gallery in Rome in 1973. Douglas Hubler made this work with the two dealers and the Rodin Burgers of Calais, which is a copy of which is in Rome. Uh, and they used it for their joint page in the Cologne Kunstmark catalog the following year. A prelude to them opening a gallery in New York with Angela Westwater who was then Carl Andre's girlfriend. This was the time of Contemporana in Rome. Um, in November 1973, as the catalog cover shows, it was held in a car park under the Villa Borghese. Carl's work for the exhibition in Rome was one of the kind of twig pieces 
uh, showing the steps in the underground car park. This is one of my favorite photographs of Conrad resting while installing Idea Licht, a section of Documenta 5 in Castle in 1972. Documenta 5 opened in Castle the 30th of June and ran through to the 8th of October 1972, Boyce's 100 Days. It was curated by Harold Zeman. Johannes Cladders told Brigitte Cole, um, Conrad's section at Documenta 5 showed what I myself represented, and I believe that that was where I belonged. The Documenta 72 was the documenta at which one could find a large part of the artists represented by Conrad. It was actually also the show that for the first time directly presented contemporary art, especially in Conrad Fisher's section. And Brigitte asks, wasn't it a bit disreputable that Conrad, as a gallery owner, conceived a section of documenta and also displayed artists from his own gallery? And uh, Johannes Cladders, who's the curator of München Gladbach, uh, uh, replied, Conrad was appointed a chaperone, Klaus Honneth, and then he laughed. I'm not aware that anyone objected. Conrad was not only a gallerist, but an authority. Selling was not his top priority. Of course, he was interested in selling, but selling was not his main intention. To give Karl, the last word, he also told Brigitte, Conrad was a great catalyst in the art world of Europe. Had he never shown with Conrad Fischer, I'm quite sure, had I never shown with Conrad Fischer, I'm quite sure that my life as an artist would have ended long ago. Art is quite dead in the United States. The love of great prices has driven out the love of art. Being an artist has become as boring and careerist as being a stockbroker. Thank you. Did I have... Yeah. To finish with Seth's International General first publication when he left the States and came to live in Europe. And I had one last piece which I wanted to mention, um, which is Carl's little exhibition in 73 in Innsbruck in Austria. And it's the first CV in this document which mentions that he had been drafted and spent a year and a half in the US military. None of the previous literature in Europe had mentioned that, like Elvis, he had GI blues. <laughs> So, welcome back. Um, we will um, now proceed with the second part of this uh, first day of the Calendar Symposium. Um, we're very pleased to have Professor Anna Chave uh, here today. Um, we've learned uh, a lot from uh, Professor Chave's uh, criticism, art historical criticism and, and feminist critique uh, along the years, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have uh, Professor Chave today uh, speak about Carl Andre in this exhibition. Um, I will read, uh, as I did with uh, Professor Linda Morris, the biography uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, Professor Chave's um, activity. She's a professor of art history at Queens College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She has published many essays concerned with gender and identity, reception, and interpretation, mainly with respect to 20th century art. She is the author of monographs on Matt Rothko in 1989 and Constantin Brancusi in 1993, and is also widely known for her revisionist readings of minimalism, including the essays Minimalism and the Rhetoric of Power from 1990, Minimalism and Biography from 2000, and Revaluing Minimalism, Patronage, Aura, and Place 2008. Um, welcome, Professor Chafe, and I look forward to your talk. The title of the talk is Grave Matters, Positioning Carl Andre at Career's End. <laughs> I don't want no retrospective, reads an iconic 1979 text painting by Ed Rouchet. 
out of possibly feigned aversion to the limelight or out of apprehension at the prospect of having a career prematurely foreclosed, some minority of artists does refuse the crowning right of the retrospective. Carl Andre numbered for a time among the recalcitrant, according to the New York Times, warning Dia curators, I can't stop you from doing it, but don't expect me to do anything to help. Given that Andre has officially retired from making art, there's no question of the present exercise being premature, however. And he cooperated with the staging of a retrospective in Europe in the mid-90s, as well as prior such endeavors. So it is conceivable that this reluctance was more a defensive reflex on the part of an artist whose reputation in the US has been fraught since his third wife fell from their 34th floor New York apartment during an autumn night in 1985. That wife was, of course, the Cuban-American artist Ana Mendieta, with whom he had had a tumultuous relationship. And that event occasioned an ongoing, quote, moratorium against the artist, as James Meyer put it in an art forum review of the present show, that speaks darkly of how his own efforts to initiate an exhibition were, quote, suppressed, in one case with Savonarola-like fervor. A Calvin Tompkins New Yorker profile pointed uh, in pre-publicity for the show to some punishment that Andre has suffered at the hands of feminists, notably including a 1995 Guerrilla Girls poster that dubbed him the OJ of the art world. And Holland Cotter's New York Times review speculates that Dia's show failed to find additional US venues on account of the cloud lingering over the artist here. We may thus recognize in outline, at least in Myers and Tompkins' accounts, a paradoxical yet familiar maneuver whereby that archetypal, arch, archetypal figure of privilege, a straight white male, displaces a paradigmatically marginalized figure, namely a woman of color, from her evident position as a victim. Feminists have lately been chided for victimizing Andre then, while the advent of Dia's show has predictably sparked renewed feminist conversation regarding his and Mendieta's respective legacies. Some male critics have suggested that as Mendieta's posthumous reputation grows, ill feeling toward the more celebrated Andre might accordingly subside. But the reverse may be just as easily imagined. The more we appreciate the full scope of Mendieta's contributions, the more we may lament having lost her. Aggressively refuting former DIA director Philip Verne's wishful prediction that the Andre show would occasion no demonstrations, Kristen Clifford and the No Wave Performance Task Force poured putrid chicken blood and guts at the entrance to DIA's Chelsea offices in May in an act of protest loosely referencing an early work by Mendieta. Meantime, some blog entries by Mira Shore, who decried Tompkins' pandering portrayal of Andre, sparked a feminist urgent roundtable in New York. That event revealed some disarray among feminists, however, which has been general from the outset of this sordid matter, as is confirmed by Robert Katz's well-researched 1990 book concerning Andre's trial for the murder of Mendieta. Many feminists, abhorring the prospect that Mendieta could remain defined by the role of victim, are intent on downplaying that aspect of her legacy. Complicating matters, too, is Andre's extensive history with art world women. Of those who suffered abuse at his hands, and gallerist Angela Westwater, for one, has lately admitted enduring verbal but not physical abuse, no one would go on record at the time of the trial. As for Andre's recent claims to being himself a feminist, they cannot be dismissed as merely self-serving, for he occasionally positioned himself in related ways well before Mendieta's death, unusually so for a man of his generation. A longtime friendship with Lucy Lepard, the honorary dean of feminist art criticism, may help explain, for that matter, Andre's having underwritten printing costs for the first issue of the feminist magazine Heresies in 1977, or his appearance on a panel at the feminist gallery AIR on the occasion in 1979 of the first solo show of Mendieta, whom he met that night. Enlivening the intramural conversations, too, are the diverse views feminists hold of Andre's art, which some may reject out of hand, while others are deeply admiring. The latter view can entail resigned acknowledgement, however, of that old story, as Mira Shore succinctly put it, 
that some very good art is made by some very awful people. Even as they admit Andre's inarguable importance, some feminist art historians have declined to see Dia's show, a gesture that one wryly equated in conversation to boycotting Amazon. That is an act of omission bound to go unremarked. Finally, and most glaringly, of course, there is the matter of the legal resolution of the murder trial, namely the judge's conclusion that the evidence did not satisfy him beyond a reasonable doubt that Andre was guilty. Regardless that it remains a fairly commonplace assumption among feminists that Andre murdered Mendieta then, the justice system has irrevocably ruled otherwise, a blunt fact that all accounts of the artists that venture to mention the case must affirm. That the US justice system has tended historically to favor whites is a matter of record to which many of us, or perhaps I should specify many of us white people, are becoming increasingly sensitized. For some women of color in the art world, that fact, to which they needed no further sensitization, has all along loomed large in Andre's case. African American artist Howardina Pindell, for one, called the outcome, quote, totally symbolic. Your life isn't worth shit. Besides which, Pindell charged, I know if Anna had been an Anglo and if Carl had been black, the art world would have lynched him. Setting aside considerations for which Andre may not be held personally accountable, though, the question must be posed. Why an acquitted man should have remained in the US under the shadow of an incident that has not at all dogged him in Europe, where he has long had a significant presence, and Linda Morris filled us in on that, some part of that story this morning. Broadly speaking, Europeans have proven more willing to compartmentalize the personal from the professional behavior of public figures. Thus, whereas the neo-Marxist Louis, Louis Althusser, for one, was spared trial in France for the murder of his wife, he continued to publish freely from the institution where he was confined, including an account of the murder, which raised hackles more for the fact that such autobiographical writing contravened his Marxist principles than for the admitted fact of suffocation. She's, if she's described at all, she's usually described as a difficult woman. That Andre has not been entirely accorded a post-trial presumption of innocence in his native land cannot be chalked up simply to our more moralizing ways, however. Rather, some extenuating circumstances of the case demand explanation. First off, it bears noting that the judge who presided over Andre's trial has since made the highly unusual choice to go on record at least twice to opine that the artist, quote, probably did it explaining that the acquittal had been a close call made on the basis of the allowable evidence. Secondly, some of the most incriminating evidence in the case could not in fact be introduced in the trial on account of some administrative bungling by the district attorney's office and the police, as is detailed by Katz. In particular, the fact that forensic testing showed that there were no footprints on the windowsill out of which the barefooted Mendieta fell is the more damning a piece of evidence because nearly three quarters of the petite artist's body would have been below the sill as she stood on the floor. She would have had to clamber onto the sill to exit the window deliberately, in other words, and yet not only was there material evidence that she did not do so, but her family and close friends all knew that she was so terrified of heights that she avoided even the routine opening of windows, whether or not in high-rise buildings. Finally, no one who knew Mendieta, whose career was on an upswing in 1985, regarded her as being in the least suicidal. Andre's immediate account of what happened between himself and Mendieta, delivered to a 911 operator, was as follows. My wife is an artist and I'm an artist, and we had a quarrel about the fact that I was more uh, exposed to the public than she was. And she went to the bedroom and I went after her and she went out of the window. Andre has since been largely closed-mouthed about the matter, and his friends seem generally not to have pressed him about it. But when his Italian dealer, John Enzo Speroni, did ask directly what had happened, not long after the fact, Andre reportedly responded, it's impossible, and then added, but I was drunk. That he and Mendieta both drank a lot has become at times a focal point of this story, as at once an explanation for why the truth of the encounter is bound to remain elusive and as a kind of mitigating factor, 
inasmuch as diminished competence may serve as a form of legal excuse. It interests me, accordingly, that among the distinctive choices Dia made in positioning Andre for this major occasion is its exposition of three continuously running documentary videos, two of which showcase the artist's identity as an immoderate drinker. In the video portrait of 1976, Andre drinks throughout an hour plus conversation with an unseen interlocutor before appearing in the final frames lying flat on his back as if passed out. And in the circa 1982 dinner party video, he intermittently holds forth for over 50 minutes during a drunken art world social gathering. In his recent interviews with Tompkins and with his old friend Barbara Rose, Andre himself newly emphasizes his longtime identity as an insatiable drinker and a bar rat. Though both critics find him acute on the whole throughout exchanges involving protracted reliance on memory, he tells each point blank that my mind has been destroyed by alcohol. Per his self-description, in other words, this is not a figure who may be held fully responsible for his own actions any longer, if he ever could be. Another distinctive choice that Dia made in positioning Andre for the present show is the new visibility it accords to a body of assemblage works by him, such as the sly dark twist of 1986, note the date, which the curators group under the rubric Dada Forgeries. Andre's close friend Hollis Frampton described him in 1969 as having used that term to characterize an early body of eccentric work, quote, scores of objects less witty than funny in an enigmatically vulgar way. Andre only once exhibited work under the Dada Forgeries rubric, however, namely on the occasion of his first exhibition in New York City following his murder trial. That show, organized in 1988 by the fringy gallerist Julian Preto, featured a recent work called Large Door, a presumed pun on Large Door, which is reproduced in Dia's catalog. The show's only reviewer, Alfred McAdam, observed that the door in question was in fact a window, though it appears to be a wood-framed window screen, which is torn. Calling Andre's gesture an exercise in catachresis, that is the deliberate misnaming of an object, McAdam posed the question, when is a window a door? His reply, when Marcel Duchamp says it is, then occasioned the mention of various iconic Duchamp works involving windows and doors. Seemingly the most germane of those works is the 1920 Fresh Widow, mistakenly called Fresh Window in this review. French windows are doors uh, of a kind, of course, and the window that Mendieta fell out of became a de facto door, which made of André a fresh widow or widower. McAdam didn't explicitly mention Mendieta or the trial in his review of André's oddball comeback show, but he devoted a paragraph to philosoph philosophizing about death, pondering grandly whether it represents a, quote, liberation or a burden and whether the death of others grants us a postponement, a displacement to someone else of the inevitable. Finally, he benignly posed the question whether large door could be understood, quote, outside the context of Carl Andre's biography. Andre is most celebrated, not for quirky pseudo dadaist experiments, of course, but as a founding father of minimalism, which was long understood as epitomizing a depersonalized mode of art practice. That perception is in certain respects deceptive, or so, have, so I have argued elsewhere, but some lip service continues to be paid in the present catalog by Verne uh, to the idea of Andre's art as reflexively excluding the biographical. Among the canonical minimalists, however, Andre proved the most consistently, even obsessively autobiographical in how he framed and positioned work that he describes as evidence of temperament. One doesn't need to be much of an Andre expert to be able to recite the oft-rehearsed anecdotes about his grandfather, the bricklayer, or about his sources in his hometown of Quincy, its shipyards, its granite quarries, and so on. While he hasn't harped on it in the same way, his Dada Forgery show could easily be construed as a pointed post-trial chapter to the same long-running autobiography. 
In labeling a fairly extensive body of Andre's work data forgeries and foregrounding their recovery of that work, Dia curators effectively hark back to the haunted Prado show of that title. Verne's catalog essay refers to forgery further as an act entailing a, quote, harmful and illicit dimension, and to forgers as akin to great criminal masterminds who test our ethical certitudes. Before he asks about Andre, a question similar to that broached in court decades ago, namely, is he an outlaw? There follows, of course, a reassuring reply. An anarchist at the most allows Verne. On the face of it, that is judging by the references tallied in the index, Mendieta factors in Dia's catalog only in passing. A biographical outline mentions the artist's meeting, then sketches in the ghastly close of their relationship, and that nearly covers it. Certain texts in the catalog evince a preoccupation with the topic of death, however, which has not historically been a dominant thread in the Andre literature. Although longtime critical bias militates against attaching themes of any kind to minimalist production, the essays by Verne, uh, by Dia Curator Yasmil Raymond, and by commissioned author Arnaud Pierre all point to a thematic of death, putatively underwriting Andre's work. Raymond begins her essay, oddly as I see it, by referring to the, quote, unclear funerary role of ancient Greek koros and kore statues, before describing Andre's work as expressing, quote, a politics of solemnity and intimacy typically reserved for monuments, graveyards, tombs, and shrines. Verne, likewise, argues for Andre's ongoing interest in memorialization, and closes with a reference to a late photographic project by Andre, described as a melancholic meditation on presence and void, on what we memorialize and commemorate. The photo Verne illustrates by way of example is that of the balcony of Andre's apartment, replete with the railing that could have protected Mendieta had she exited the panes of glass leading here instead of the bedroom one. Further, a modest vase of roses that casts some spiky shadows oddly adorns the stark balcony in what may amount to a widower's belated, contrived gesture of commemoration. The formative period of Andre's career long predates Mendieta's demise, of course, and there is a limited corpus of sculptures from those years that may be said to somehow reference death. Behrens and Raymond's essays each mention a case in point, uh, namely an ephemeral work called Grave that he made of sand for a 1967 museum show called Monuments, Tombstones, Trophies, uh, and Lament for the Children, first done at PS1 in 1976 and now on view here. Such works, uh, as well as the stone field sculpture that Andre installed in 1977 on a plot of land adjacent to a uh, historic cemetery in Hartford, have occasioned elsewhere some germane critical commentary concerning their morbid overtones. But the tenuous notion that death comprises a thematic through line in Andre's art is one that finds its most insistent expression in the present catalog. In constructing Andre as a figure preoccupied by death, Verne and Raymond appear themselves uh, rather to be so preoccupied. That is, they appear to be, reading between the lines, possibly haunted by Mendieta's harrowing end. A more equivocal account of Andre's putative commemorative intentions to which Verne's and Raymond's texts seem indebted is a chapter called Memorials in Alastair Ryder's 2011 monograph on Andre. Focusing especially on a work that Andre reportedly considers a kind of master key to his art, his 1973 Quincy book, which depicted among other features his hometown's monument making industry, replete with a photo of his family tombstone. Ryder posited a, quote, latent affinity for memorialization in Andre's project. Quote, if Andre's works are at all memorial-like, he conjectured, then they are so only an abstract. They are monuments dedicated to commemorating their own presence. And he added, if Andre's sculptures are memorials, then they are strange ones indeed. I am, of course, taking liberties by reading into Verne's and Raymond's essay a kind of haunting by the specter of Mendieta. But in the text by Arnold Pierre, her ghost is practically palpable. 
His essay's epigraph is a passage from a surrealist poem by Aragon, which proposes the most beautiful monument man can raise on a square cannot compete with the splendid chaotic heap. Then, under the subtitle Deja Vu, Pierre commences his essay by conjuring a chilling image of André standing at his 34th floor window, witnessing an event wherein bodies plummeted from a skyscraper. Ostensibly, Pierre is not revisiting the chaotic heap formed by Mendieta's body at the foot of André's residential skyscraper. Ostensibly, he is writing about the New York City-based events of 9-11 which the elderly artist reportedly witnessed from his Greenwich Village high rise, and which Pierre tries, unconvincingly, to conflate with the tenor of the era leading to the minimalist movement. Andre could not actually have seen the bodies falling from his high rise on 9-11, but the far greater height of the World Trade Center buildings and the notorious scale of the carnage that day serve implicitly, of course, to render Mendieta's fate a minor matter by comparison. Omitting the controversial photos of the bodies plunging from the Twin Towers, such as the one I'm showing you here, Pierre reproduces instead a 1983 French magazine spread comparing their shapes to some Alain Kirali sculptures. And he salutes the, quote, particularly effective form of the terrorist attacks, which may not be considered artworks in themselves, he cautions, just in case he might have confused anyone on that point. This peculiar borderline offensive essay concludes with a segment teasingly entitled, The Fall of Bodies, where again, the falling body that comes automatically to mind in connection with Andre goes conspicuously unmentioned. Instead, striking a chord with Verne and Raymond, Pierre enumerates the smattering of works by Andre that reference death, and calls for an analysis of a, quote, funereal and melancholy expression said to be endemic in minimalism generally. He invokes generic tomb sculpture, funerary slabs, sarcophagi, and so, so forth for their putative resemblance to Andre's production in particular, but he withholds illustrations of such, such objects which would likely serve only to undercut his point. These are my illustrations. Pierre proves less preoccupied with death at the center of his essay, where we find André graphically constructed instead as a, quote, phallophobic, anti-priapic artist, whose refusal to erect monuments and whose detumescent columns incapable of erection, such as the 1966 lever, are said to represent a Bataillon attack on verti verticality. The essay's title, for that matter, is Broken is the High Column. It's a Michelangelo poem line. On Lever and a few other gravitational columns in the art of the 1960s. It was Andre who first characterized Lever as preapic, suggesting that the horizontal lie of the sculpture represents the engaged position for the phallus, that is, quote, running along the earth. The notion that, and, that Andre's radicality lies especially in his having lowered or brought down sculpture is advanced also in Dia's catalog by Verne and by Raymond. And an essay on the fall of sculpture by Bryony Fair argued back in 1996 that his oeuvre should accordingly be understood as anti-phallic. In the present context, however, Pierre's insistent reading of impotence into Andre's art seems to buttress other efforts to counter any lingering idea of the artist as ever having represented a physical threat, including the aforementioned emphasis on the not unrelated image of a pathetically alcoholic figure who, in his own recent words, couldn't fight my way out of a cookie jar. To Pierre, moreover, it follows from his vision of an anti-phallic Andre that the artist is presumed to constitute a, quote, poor target for my own 1990 analysis of the masculinist valences of the minimalist enterprise. That analysis has often been caricatured as having caricatured minimalism as phallic, pure and simple. My argument was instead, however, that minimalism can be seen as replicating, but also at times as implicating, quote, 
those systems of mediation which have overdetermined our history, money, the phallus, and the concept as privileged operators of meaning. That's a line I cribbed from Alice Jardine, by the way. Quote, this is authority represented as authority does not usually like to represent itself, I ventured. Authority as authoritarian. Although Pierre lights into minimalism and the rhetoric of power as if it were my final word on the movement issued just yesterday, it was penned a quarter century ago, uh, ago at a time when an extending a feminist critique into the realm of abstract art seemed just conceivable, right at the moment when two key players in the minimalist ambit were publicly enduring their days in court, namely Andre and Richard Serra. Inevitably, the essay reads now in some ways as a period piece. When the obvious question gets posed, however, whether there is aggressivity to be found in Andre's art, or whether the allegations of aggressivity attach instead strictly to the man, surely the closest anyone has come to making the former case remains my 1990 essay. It argued that the minimalists, quote, effectually, perpetu or, sorry, effectually perpetrated violence through their work violence against the conventions of art and against the viewer. In addressing the masculinist hyperbole deployed by the minimalist artists, my essay succumbed to some hyperbole of its own. But it has its subtleties too, uh, and it insisted on a distinction between artworks that could perpetrate actual violence, as Sarah's earlier work at times did, versus art whose violence resides on another level, such as Andre's, which I described as affecting a form of quote, psychological aggression. As for the more pointed issue of violence expressly against women, my essay addressed it in general terms or by indirection. If minimalist art can be said to place viewers in the position of victim, then that position will resonate differently for those in different subject positions, I noted. With respect to Andre, however, others have pointed to some sadistic phrases in his writing, including an early poem that begins, the ways of love were sometimes my revenge when I was wronged by something dead or said, sorry, done or said, and she stood naked by the window, waiting to be struck, perhaps, where her white breasts were red. Mindful of the fact that Mendieta was nearly nude when she fell from Andre's apartment, Robert Katz chose Naked by the Window as the title for his book. It bears adding at this juncture that nothing that I or anyone else has ever said about Andre's work makes it sound anywhere near as threatening as it did in the description of his peer, Eva Hesse, who observed of his metal planes that they were, quote, the concentration camp for me. They were those showers that they put on the gas, even as she professed her sense of closeness to the work, which she said, does something to my insides. At a panel discussion occasioned by a 2006 Jewish Museum show of Hesse's work, Andre put in a then unusual public appearance, announcing from the floor that he wished specifically to respond to this remark. To paraphrase here for want of a transcript, Andre proceeded to say that he understood Hesse's feeling because he had had a comparable sensation himself, namely when he worked at the outset of his career in Frank Stella's studio right when Stella was formulating those famously liminal black paintings which represent to some the true starting point for minimalism. Andre had a hand in titling these paintings, proposing for one, Panel Johnson, the name of an unsuccessful artist who murdered two women, a news item that reportedly fascinated both men at the time. Several of the eventual titles, such as for the 1958 Arbeit Mach Frey, which you see here, referenced instead Nazi Germany, which had formed a distant backdrop to Stella's and Andre's Massachusetts childhoods within families of Christian descent. By comparing his experience of Stella's paintings with Hesse's experience of his sculpture, Andre was in a way equating his long ago psychic struggles in a friend's studio to the mindset of a woman whose life was derailed by the Holocaust where she lost her entire extended family to the gas chambers or the like, and who was, at the time she evoked this image of the camps, poised to die at roughly the same mid-30s age as Mendieta later did, though of natural causes. Any sense of disproportion in this analogy seemed to be lost on Andre, 
whose contribution left the audience dumbstruck. As for the fascist titles of Stella's paintings, Andre was evidently not instrumental in choosing them. As a young artist especially, though, he shared with his friend Frampton a profound admiration for Ezra Pound, who of course had acted as a fascist mouthpiece in Italy, though he didn't join Frampton in forming the cult around the aged poet confined at a DC mental hospital. Uh, by the way, Frampton took the picture of Stella that you're seeing now. I interject here the case of Pound, both because his name tends to arise when the question is broached whether an artist's more despicable impulses have meaningfully infiltrated his art, and because his name appears frequently in Dia's catalog, nominally on account of its intensive attention to Andre's poetry. In Pound's case, convincing arguments have been made that his anti-Semitism permeated his work in ways both obvious and subtle. Whereas in my view, no parallel argument can reasonably be made that an unhinged misogyny somehow underpins Andre's practice. Yet the gnawing suspicion that Andre got away with murder, whether literally so or in the vernacular sense of that phrase, a suspicion troubling not only a feminist fringe, remember, but also the male judge who presided over the trial, continues variously to affect how the artist is seen and treated. So I am proposing here. And to those who value Mendieta, that scenario must be, however marginally, better than all out forgetting. Returning to minimalism and the rhetoric of power, I happen to be interested in 1990, not only in minimalist aggression toward the viewer, but also in the viewer's sometime attacks on this work, which as I have since learned from conservator friends, happens to be a leading target of vandals. And one of the things that specially impressed me about Dia's uh, presentation of Andre uh, is how defended he seems to be here. I did not get to see Andre's recreation of his signal outdoor work joint on my visit, uh, for instance, uh, because I did not know that that required an advance appointment, something no first time visitor would know, presumably, uh, which helps limit the audience for that isolated work to devotees intent on a return visit. Practice museum goer though I am, I also got warned enough by guards in the galleries that I took to simply consulting them preemptively. I was warned about getting too close to the scatter works, for instance, and about walking on any of the planes, which appear utterly pristine. Andre is getting protected even from himself here, in short, since he cannot provide an experience universally considered central to his work, and one that counts among the most radical gestures of his cohort namely that of treading on his middle planes. Reviewers have regretfully noted this prohibition, which is suspended only for the outsized 46 Roaring Forties, while deducing that it must originate with the work's lenders. Logical an explanation as that is, I, I find that I am allowed to walk on the planes in public collections more often than not, so I wonder whether some alternative loans may have been available. Regardless, the prohibition here seems in keeping with an effort to position Andre as a figure who warrants protecting, including from his own most extreme impulses. Dia seems to act to protect Andre also in a way by its omission or deferring of text and discourse. There are practically no wall labels in the show, for instance, and I at least had to hunt around for the handout that details what work lies where a booklet that incidentally thanked me for respecting these delicate historical works. I appreciate that labels can be a mixed blessing, at times distracting viewers from artworks, although it, honestly it took me much more time with the brochure figuring out uh, what was there than I ever spend on a wall label. Um, but I expect that what is entailed here is in part a precept long considered endemic in minimalism that of prizing an ideal of direct experience. And in part, Andre's own emphasis on the preeminence of matter to his art. Matter matters is his longtime motto, and one that subtends an aversion to mediation. I hate information, I want experience, he insists. Experience is the essence of my work. Dia's handout guides visitors by citing Andre's directive that, quote, things have qualities, perceive the qualities. 
And that lesson is underscored by numerous of the catalog essays. Uh, Anne Rorimer and Brooke Holmes, for instance, both cite Andre's wish to, quote, submit to the properties of my materials. While Rorimer notes, too, his admission of his, quote, extremely modest and ever declining physical strength as an explanation for the typically moderate scale of his work, which serves besides to reinforce the conceit of a weak and submissive Andre. Also, in a way, deprivileging or deferring discourse is the unusual design of the show's catalog, where after a page that reads simply Carl Andre, 221 successive full pages of photographs lead off the publication, followed by only about half as many, 112 pages of brief illustrated essays, plus the back matter. A bias against interpretation in Susan Sontag's famous phrase might even be discerned not in the fact of this symposium, of course, but in its structure. All four invited speakers were initially meant to present on one day in a more typical format, allowing all involved to engage at once with one another. But we were finally divided over two days, so as I was told, to allow everyone more time to experience the art. We were also divided by gender, and the artist is appearing for the male section of uh, the uh, symposium. Such thinking may suit Andre Partisans, and it aligns with the distinctive priorities of Dia's founders, I realize. But I wonder whether institutional anxiety over the prospect of a concentrated conversation regarding Andre's case could help explain the present, more dispersed arrangement. In terms of impulses of institutional self-protection, I will admit also, as an aside, that I wonder whether the Latina identity of the show's lead curator may further be construed in strategic terms. Finally, and just as one would expect, Dia has assembled an impressive exhibition, which largely on honors Andre's concept of his vision. The artist eventually joined in the endeavor, moreover, aiding especially in the installation, which is compelling by any estimation. But in view of all the subtle and unsubtle efforts that Dia has arguably made to protect Andre, I admit that I remain baffled by one glaring lapse, namely its failure to defend him from me. <laughs> Couldn't figure that out. The, that's, I'm going to be done. The occasion of an artist's full career retrospective doesn't seem like the ideal moment to conduct a feminist reckoning, even to me. And I debated whether to accept this invitation. But the awful fact that Mindiana never got to see through her profoundly promising career and so to enjoy a comparable occasion remains ever salient to me, as it does to so many others. And when I recalled Katz's description of the nearly impenetrable wall of silence that he found around Andre in the art world when he researched his book, he cites, for instance, gallerist Paula Cooper, Andre, and others vowing in the aftermath of the trial that no one among the participants would ever speak of the case again. It appeared that silence was the less honorable of the available options. To enunciate feminist speech can seem a futile gesture, I admit. But lately, the problems in the US of persistent violence against women in the military, on college campuses, in the NFL, have become front page news, a continuous topic of conversation even at the uppermost levels of policymaking. The conversations and the legal implications that ensue often tend to be treacherous, of course. With rape, we return repeatedly to the he said, she said dilemma, which can prove just as tricky, legally speaking, as the he said, she's dead scenario represented by Andre's case and alcohol continues to complicate matters. No less tricky and equally or more crucial in the, are the, than the ongoing legal and procedural conversations, however, are the potential conversations about our cultural imaginary and what might constitute salutary interventions in its makeup. Andre occasionally used profoundly misogynist speech, as when he wrote in 1978, for instance, that wood is the mother of matter. Like all women hacked and ravaged by men, she renews herself by giving, gives herself by renewing. Alastair Ryder notes mildly that the artist had absorbed commonplace Western assumptions concerning, concerning the feminine and passive identity of matter versus the masculine and active identity of form. True enough. But Andre's demented notion that women thrive on being brutalized is likewise a cultural commonplace, and one that infects not only a masculine imaginary, though that is, of course, where such perverse notions are largely directed. 
Given that the cultural imaginary is familiar ground for artists, Andre, that self-styled feminist fellow traveler, could have elected to deconstruct such insidious assumptions instead. A recent global review of violence against women found that 30% report being physically or sexually assaulted by a partner in a type of survey that is almost invariably said to involve massive underreporting. The head of the WHO calls it a global health problem of epidemic proportions. Fully 40% of women killed worldwide were slain by their partners. We are not just talking about the Taliban with such numbers. In short, we are also talking about ourselves. How do we explain such findings? How do we address them? Such are the questions that I'm starting to be encouraged. Upcoming generations may be concerned to pursue. Thank you. So, thank you very much for being so curious. Thank you, Professor Che, for your talk, um, which I understand as a, a very thorough compilation of all the questions. Yeah. Um, all the questions that we have and criticism we, are, we have received uh, about multiple aspects of this show. Um, I think I speak in the name of uh, all of us at DIA. Um, for us, there has been no wall of silence, no fear of free opinion. We invited Arnaud Pierre, and we were very happy of his commission essay as, as gladly and eagerly as we invited you. So it was not. Though, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I think we were not aware of this need to protect ourselves, but rather to bring the necessary debates and um, to prevent uh, this uh, exhibition to have an elephant in the room. We don't think there is such a, such a question. And um, I think we are very proud of this exhibition. And unfortunately, we don't have time to um, bring you through each of our departments to respond thoroughly to the questions that you uh, presented concerning visitation, why lenders uh, didn't let some people step on the walls, why do we decided to have certain policies, why do we decide to uh, stick to the DS style and have a brochure instead of exhibition labels and pedagogical texts. Um, I mean, I could enumerate all the questions that you touched upon that were of, uh, of from uh, curatorial related and that we have had thorough debates and I think very reasonable conversations with many colleagues. Um, I would say also that the number of uh, polemical um, interpolations that you have presented to us today uh, makes it very difficult for me to be a moderator because at the same time uh, we have a guest uh, speaker who had a um, very different proposition and uh, it would be, um, I think, a little bit disrespectful uh, to work, Professor Linda Morris, to uh, center this debate upon all your comments and sometimes accusations. Um, therefore, and as a moderator, as a responsible moderator, I would propose uh, that perhaps Linda Morris gives us some comments about uh, what uh, she's heard and if she decides to, to um, proceed with the conversation on, uh, along these lines. Otherwise, I have a few questions. Um, Linda. I nearly didn't want to come up. Okay. Uh, I nearly didn't come up because I found it very difficult um, in all sorts of ways. Um, 
to respond to what you've been saying without um, uh, a lot of preparation, but it was also sent me thinking about a lot of things. Um, I've just been making notes here. Uh, I've been very attracted uh, to going to places that are very difficult. I, I think um, I, I was in Johannesburg this summer, um, and I was staying in the university district of Johann Johannesburg, and um, you had 12-foot walls around the guest house with electric fences on top, and you had a man with a gun patrolling the streets. And um, I, I, the second day I was there, I went to the local restaurant and came across, uh, you know, a mugging had just taken place, and the guy had been run over, and it was all ambulances and everything. This was very difficult. I was also invited, because of my work on Picasso, uh, to go to Ramallah for the Picasso in Palestine project. Um, and after a very kind of pleasant week in Ramallah, I went into uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv um, and found that immensely difficult. Um, before that, I... Uh, in 85, I spent about three weeks um, in East Berlin, Dresden, and Leipzig in, in 85, when it was still the Eastern Bloc. And the thing I found most difficult after three weeks, I was doing interviews with people who'd spent the war years in London, um, telling, uh, and had then chosen to go back into um, the communist part of, uh, of Germany rather than the western part. Um, but the worst visit I ever made was to New York in 73. I, uh, I was Richard Hamilton's assistant for his exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum, and I was very, very excited about coming to, to New York. And um, I wasn't prepared for the amount of homelessness. I'd never seen anything like that before, people with lice crawling on their heads on the Bowery, sort of just uh, sitting there. And I went to dinner at um, Keith Milo's flat for Jasper Johns and for Richard Hamilton and Mark. Um, and when I got to Keith's uh, flat in Soho, a loft, um, I had to ring the bell for him to come down two flights, and there was this man not sort of so far away as the door um, who had a stick and was just bashing the wall. And I had to wait for Keith to come down the two floors to let me in. And of all my experiences, that was the most terrifying in my life. And... You know, it took me a long time of digging and things to realize that there was this terrible heroin epidemic in New York of post-Vietnam uh, people coming back and sort of being just dumped on, on the streets and the violence and the terror that was here in New York. In the midst of all that, um, Conrad Fisher was here and uh, with Gerhard Richter for Richter's first exhibition in New York, and they invited me to go to dinner with Carl Andre one evening. Um, and that was very difficult. Um, I was having a relationship with Conrad Fischer, and um, Carl didn't approve of this because Conrad was married and had two children. And he made that very plain throughout the dinner. He also couldn't eat food like the rest of it, that Angela Westwater had cooked for the rest of us. Uh, Carl had everything mashed up and was just eating like this soup. And this is, I'm, I'm talking back in, in 73. And I find it very difficult to target a lot of what you said on one individual as opposed to a whole society which 
I felt a kind of rottenness at the core of it. And that's something I feel very strongly about. I come from Scottish fishing family, and I don't have any middle-class background of any sort, no family money or, or anything like that. And um, uh, I, I, I kind of have difficulty whenever I feel a kind of class bias going on, which I find much more difficult to deal with class biases than I find to be able to deal with male-female biases. Um, I'm sorry, these are all the thoughts that were going through my mind when I was listening to you, Anna. I'm, I apologize, I just don't see how they pertain to my paper, and I don't see how they really pertain to Andre's case. So I, I don't know how to answer. Maybe it'd be good to turn it over to the floor, do you think, mm. that people um, ask questions? Perhaps, uh, yes, yeah, someone has a comment uh, or a question. I mean, I think there are still many comments that, I mean, I offered um, Linda Morris the possibility to speak because um, I also think that she pertains and she has participated. Um, Andriana, how are you? Great. Let's hold it for a second. Um, hold it one second. Um, uh, Professor Linda Morris pertains and has participated uh, in, the, in the decades that we as young art historians and curators are most interested in and um, that we have, I think, made a, a very, very conscious and, and uh, consistent choice of presenting here as a full timeline. Um, I think many of the, of the comments and uh, anecdotes that Professor Linda Morris has shared um, do pertain to provide a larger background on why these questions, I think, have to be put into perspective. Unfortunately, here, well, I mean, at some point I was almost convinced that you didn't come as an art historian but as a journalist, but um, then there seemed to be some art historical comments that suddenly became a review of our show, and I expected something new. As I said, we're very ready to give you a full report on our old, uh, all our decisions. But um, as art historians uh, organizing a symposium, we really had a desire to connect things from a larger perspective and try to understand Carl Anders production um, from the perspective of not only um, international uh, history beyond art, but also in terms of his various uh, layers of biographical um, influence and resonance in the work. Um, I would sort of like throw the, the question back at you and I would try to understand how on the one hand, and I will ask you, uh, how on the one hand do you think this fact, uh, this event that, I mean, as a, maybe as a European, I'm, I'm, I'm myself uh, ignorant and biased, but I consider it unresolved and, um, but this event in 1985 can possibly influence the importance of a production that had been going on for 20 years with incredible relevance, that on the one hand. And on the, on the other hand, how uh, the symbolic violence that you attribute to a movement can tolerate on, the one, uh, on, on, on one side the subscription of many women to this movement and, you know, and through it, uh, Mary Miss, uh, uh, I mean, the list is, I think, quite populated. Um, how would you connect the subscription of many women to minimalist movements with this idea of symbolic violence that at some point sprouts in different scenes of murderous uh, violence, and on the other, how uh, this idea of symbolic violence can also uh, be consistent in a society where pretty much every single manifestation of culture is permeated by symbolic violence. I mean, we can talk about cinema, we can talk about music, we can talk about Arnold Schoenberg if you want. Um, I don't know, I think the list is, is, is pretty much uh, spatially endless. So these would be my questions to you. Uh, you know, it seems to me we're talking past each other here and we're talking past the issues. Um, Please so, go ahead and reset. Uh, I, you know, the idea that there's symbolic violence in so much art production, well, of course. 
Uh, I mean, that's a... Well, you spoke about aggressivity. Uh, right. Um, and, and I have... I... It's symbolic because these pieces, as far as I'm concerned, don't move. I haven't seen them moving. Uh, well, now you're being snide. Um, you know, I, I have an argument that was attacked in your catalog that I made back in 1990, so I was addressing that uh, attack. Uh, and that, uh, ar that argument is not actually uh, particularly where it pertains to Andre's case uh, about the work uh, affecting any kind of actual violence. And in fact, I. Uh, emphasize that. And I again. completely misunderstood yeah. your talk. Yes, I think you did completely misunderstand. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's be. Uh... Uh, how about we let the audience have a hand since we're not doing very well with each other? No, no, no. I would really love to. <laughs> I would really love to hear a response concerning questions that I think are perhaps uh, part of. I mean, my uh, my point our, is that there's uh, one of my points was that there's a difference between symbolic violence uh, and actual violence, uh -huh. uh, and there is this episode in Andre's history. It's a genuine question, no? Excuse me, I, I didn't. My questions are genuinely curious because I've been reading your text, and that's the reason of our invitation. So um, I didn't want to seem uh, sarcastic in my questions. My questions are absolutely genuine. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what the audience would like to ask. Okay. Like... Any questions, please? Um, uh, could you say the name? Yes. Hi, my name. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting, I'm getting over a cold, so. My name is Randall Edwards. Um, I have a question that, if any of you want to field, uh, about that it gets to these ideas of ways of looking at history through different lenses. And as has been explicated, perhaps through a Marxist point of view, a social historical point of view, a feminist or a gendered reading, um, is, is there some place, some nexus, where, where matter, form, phenomenology, the biographical, can all come together in a way that is not at odds? Or does an exhibition like this suggest that there are very formalist, very traditional ways of looking at things, and then there are offshoots that go against that. I know this is very art historical and meta. Um, does an exhibition like this suggest that those types of interpretations can't have a side-by-side -side harmony? Well, um, perhaps, Professor Chay, if you want to go ahead and... I think it's, it's definitely... This is a question about uh, conceptualizing question. of exhibition, which is really uh, your and uh, Yasmin's. We, well, I think it's both. So uh, I'm, I'm divided between uh, letting you speak first and, and responding from the perspective of, of, of Dia. Uh, but why don't you go first? I mean, you're, you're kind of asking the can we have it all question. Uh, and I think the answer is yes, of course, and we should, we should want to have it all, uh, right? I mean, Dia has its own history of doing things a certain way, and I've narrated part of that uh, history. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's uh, evolved over the years, inevitably, as the cast of characters has uh, changed. Um, but uh, the presentation of Andre's work is uh, largely in uh, keeping with uh, this uh, history. So uh, in terms of Dia having an ambition to do uh, a project in the way you describe, um, I think that would be out of keeping with uh, the institution's profile, shall we say. Um, I don't know if your question was art historical in a broader sense. Uh, well, I think in Andres' case and in, in many artists' cases, um, it's very difficult, to, and, and specifically concerning the question of formalism, I think it's very difficult to, um, let's say, uh, tell the legitimate, legitimately biographical from the abstracted biographical facts. Uh, I mean, I don't know, you can take any canonical example like uh, P. Mondrian's uh, Boogie Woogie and speak about the formal exercise and at the same time try to uh, track down the circumstances where this idea of Boogie Woogie uh, came to uh, Mondrian's mind or how he was involved himself in dancing. Um, I think there are readings of formalism that have prevented information uh, that is biographical to be understood as part of the work um, in the sense that you would explain the work as a tour guide and you would not necessarily need, I mean, you would not necessarily um, 
require those facts for the work to be eloquent. Uh, I think in Calandra's case, uh, it is very important to know his background, and he has himself in the Quincy book, and other examples that have, uh, have been brought up here, um, he has made a case for all these um, original sources for his preference uh, um, of certain materials like uh, steel and granite and timber wood. Um, how far you can um, consider, however, that each work is biographically informed and in that, you know, um, for instance, in connecting with uh, some of uh, Professor Chave's writings, uh, at the title of one work expresses just a coincidence or a perverse uh, pun just based on, 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 on formal characteristics of the work in a certain sentence on a historical referent, as in Frank Stella's titles, or is it really telling in terms of like a, a, a provoking and nihilistic or immoral uh, agenda? I mean, I think all that is subject to uh, specific um, to specific analysis of, of cases. You know, I, I mean, I don't think we could come up with a, with a specific criterion. Right now, if you look at Kalan's biography and in light of what uh, has been said here, um, I think Quincy is, is the, an original scene, is, is, the, is, the, is the scene of origins, and, uh, and uh, the death of Anna Mendieta uh, happens at a moment in his career with, and then it's, it's Andres' choice to, uh, you know, change completely or not, but we, we see that pretty much the, the most important part of his work had been made and that, uh, you know, other stylistical changes, you know, uh, were not really manifest uh, in, the, in the years to come. So that biographical fact is itself uh, encrypted. And, you know, like, um, I think there are many, many uh, possibilities to hypothesize on this uh, encryption and the continuity of Calandra's work after a very traumatic uh, biographical fact. Um, we have tried to track down the work, to show the periods, to, um, to present the evidence of the work in our historical terms, and I think that's the, perhaps the reason why this show is being uh, visited and revisited uh, along the year and why we think this, this show is, is doing its job. Any other questions? My name is uh, Rachel. I was curious, I believe you said that uh, you thought Europeans had a tendency to compartmentalize the personal and professional lives um, separate from each other, especially artistically. Um, I didn't know if you had ideas on the roots and the consequences of that tendency. And maybe Linda, if you wanted to comment on that too as a European. Perhaps we can ask the Europeans here. <laughs> right, Linda? Uh, yeah. And our tendency to compartmentalize or not. Um, Please, yeah. Professor Chait, maybe Well, it's, you, you know, I'm hardly the first person to point this out, right? I, I, it tends to be talked about more in terms of politicians, really, than it gets talked about in terms of uh, artists. Uh, the fact that it, Europeans really don't care who their politicians are sleeping with or how many mistresses they have or, or so forth, it's really, they consider Americans to be utterly, uh, you know, a f foolish for uh, paying attention to such uh, matters. Um, uh, but, um, no, I, I think that, uh, you know, one question that gets raised uh, repeatedly is uh, why Andre has gotten a free pass uh, in Europe. Uh, nobody really, and that was the first thing Linda said to me. She asked me what I was talking about. I told her, and she said, well, I don't know anything about that. And, uh, you know, it's just, it was like uh, just not something that has, you know, weighed on Europeans in the way. Uh, that I think it very plainly has weighed uh, on Americans. And, you know, we could talk about legacy of Puritanism or, uh, or whatever. I mean, it's bound to be at a very general uh, level. Uh, but these cultural differences do exist. I mean, however, uh, one might choose to explain them. No. I'm, I'm a great fan of Marcel Brothaus and his whole Eagle Museum. And, um, uh, you know, he, he wrote that wonderful letter to Joseph Boyce. Um, uh, it was, uh, he wrote it from Offenbach to Wagner, that he was playing the part of Offenbach and Boyce was Wagner. And it was about uh, the potential damage of 
uh, the poten continuing potential for damage of German Romanticism and the extent to which Boyce had re-fostered in another generation of artists a sense of that, uh, uh, that Romanticism. My father was in the Second World War as an ordinary soldier. He reached the peak of being a lance corporal after four and a half years in the war. Uh, and he never explained to me, but he had that sense of atrocities that had taken place that he'd witnessed by the Allies in, in Europe at the very end of the war. He was in Belgium and then in Bielefeld in Germany. And he never explained it all to me. And I asked Marcel because of a sort of sense of a Belgian, a Belgian who was a Marxist uh, uh, during, you know, as a young man at the end of the war and had a kind of distance from either the Allies or the Germans. Um, and Marcel told me this, uh, this was the final months of his life. I'm talking about uh, November 19. November, December 1975, and he died in the January. And he was going to do a presentation of figures of wax for me at University College. Um, you know, with the wax figure, we got permission for, for all of that to take place. And he told me about his idea of Europe as a field of tulips in 1945 and they put a fence down the middle of this field of tulips. And the Russians came into their half of the field with their tractors, and they simply mowed everything down. And the Americans came into their half of the field, and they gave a great big party with lots of drinking and dancing. And the next morning, their half of the field was also completely flattened. And he said, we don't know, come another season, on which side of the fence the bulbs are best preserved to grow straight and true again. And of course, since the wall came down in 89, there's a story that I've mentally gone back to time and time again. And, you know, I, I'm a Westerner, you know, I, I've grown up in a Western culture. Um, and so I can't help that sense of identity with America, uh, but also um, as a result of this visit to New York in 73, I didn't come back to the USA again until 96, and I had a sense of wanting to get out. Um, and I felt an intense pressure here in the USA as you know, quite an attractive young woman at the time, not now, um, but the, the kind of stars of the art world, uh, you know, the men physically trying to get at you, uh, I found very, very difficult because I'd never had that experience in Europe. You know, you would have a big court here and things. But it was like men felt they had a right. I don't know whether it was because I was a European woman. And I think the... the you know, sort of, I'm not interested in whether Carl's right or wrong. Um, what I am concerned about is uh, the problems in the culture here, which is to do probably with issues in the culture here, uh, which I, you know, continue to be very concerned about. Uh, so, you know, this is a strange position that I have in the midst of this discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should go into cultural difference, but perhaps we could hear a last question. Um, oh, this is the last question. Um, this, uh, or another question. Mona Hadler. Uh, I don't entirely have a question, except if we had time to discuss more. But first, I, I want to just be more direct about Honest Talk, which I thought was incredibly... Uh, courageous and really needed to be said, and I feel like I really need to have us say that also, that we struggle um, enormously with the issue of biography. 
Um, in terms of women artists, we struggle whether we have a right to minimalize them and turn them into their biography. But there is a point where biography, as Anna has shown in her writings and her speaking, is something that we do have to grapple with. And we can't really be silent about everything. And we can't always let the work just speak for itself. And whether, um, you know, I, I applaud you, Anna, for coming to speak on this because it's a complicated position and it wasn't in the book and apparently isn't on the walls and it hasn't been said. And we really do and should be speaking here about whether violence to women is okay and whether we can walk around it and say it's all right. So um, it's a I think we all subscribe to your, to your I mean, I, 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 I'm, I think, you know, like this is a, a, a civilian, I mean, urgent issue, you know, domestic violence, I mean, all these things. But uh, frankly, to bring this to a museum, of course, everywhere in the world, we should be discussing this. And, and you know, like, and, and, and probably other urgent questions that I think are, are, are urgent today. Uh, I, I mean, not that I want to dismiss your question or your, or your call for, for, for comments and for, for debate, you know, like, I, I just simply think that it's a, it's a debate that permeates the whole society and when, when you call a symposium um, and, 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 you know, I, I have the impression that it will be a little bit like everything becomes this, like the same topic, the same discussion, you know, like suddenly uh, one question becomes like the whole... Well, that may be your fear, but I felt in this brief period we were actually skirting it as opposed no, to all No, I mean, it. there's no fear. It's just a matter of like, when you say... Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I totally agree with you, but when you say that we have to have a... Um, like like a, a direct take on biography, that we cannot just pretend that works about themselves, you know, I mean, I, I think there's nothing wrong with your comment, but I will, I, I will ask you for a methodological statement about like how would you use biographical facts uh, in the process of judging an artwork. And I think in each of the cases, you will have a lot of trouble to calculate and to make some sort of uh, rule of analysis. So judgments of value or preference or sometimes uh, real questions of opposition to aspects that are uh, external to the work will contaminate your judgment. And that is, I think it's a very, very difficult issue. I don't think, uh, you know, like what you're proposing is, is very nice I, to I hear, but I would like you, to hear a little more sure about- I'm not sure you know what I'm proposing. Well, maybe I'll give it to someone else. No, keep going. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not proposing a simple answer. I, I think that Anna has proposed it uh, so much more articulately than I certainly can sitting here off the cuff. But I, what I would say is that that would be a major aspect of your catalog, of your thinking, of your show, that years would go into how to resolve and how to deal with this incredible elephant in the room of this poor young uh, woman. Mm -hmm. I, that would seem to me to have been a major uh, problem to address and not just to, in a sort of tokenist way, um, have this short discussion. Although, again, I don't think you could, we could have had, or I couldn't have had a more eloquent um, rendition of the issues than well, our Yeah, I would hope to address this question was the reason we invited uh, Professor Chave. Yes. We got it. Another question? <laughs> we got that. I, I, could, I can't help but I have to make some comments about the give and take. Uh, it, it seems that what, we're, what, I, what I've experienced is that there is an elephant in the room and, and, and it, it's ethics. That, isn't that what you really are trying to discuss here? And, and, and so I, I would like to uh, uh, throw out uh, just a, a, a remark of Wittgenstein uh, at the, the end of the Tractatus where he, he makes the comment that uh, ethics and, uh, and aesthetics are one and the same. And, and this is, is the beginning of resolving this, this incredible paradox. It's really a paradox that we're dealing with. I think Andre uh, makes some uh, 
parallel statements, actually. I mean, I think his theories about matter involve a kind of ethics about matter. Uh, so in a way, I think he um, sort of uh, makes himself all the more a kind of target for uh, such a critique. Because um, I, I think that it, kind of thinking is, uh, in a sense, integral to uh, how he has positioned his work and represented his practice. I mean, his Marxism, of course, is how it comes through most uh, clearly, uh, right? That it, there's a kind of ethics that underwrites his, uh, his practice. I think absolutely in his concept of what he's, uh, what he's doing. Well, well, I'd like to, to finish my thought with just an epigram, and it's this. Uh, uh, no ethos without eros, nor eros without pathos. And uh, that's the beginning of uh, my writing on ethos. Thank you. So um, I think we've reached our time. Perhaps a very last uh, question or comment. Well, uh, in that case, there's still one hour to see the show and uh, ask yourselves many more questions. And as you know, we are all ears. Tomorrow, um, it will be the second uh, day of this calendar symposium with Mark Godfrey and James Mayer. So feel welcome to come again. Thank you very much. All right. Gentlemen in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, and welcome to the Beacon. I'm Jasmine Raymond, and I'm curator at DIA and um, the co-curator with Philippe Verne of the exhibition um, Carl Andres, Sculpture's Place, 1958-2010. All right, everybody's here. There are seats in the front, if you want. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the serious and dedicated work that Manuel Sirauki assistant curator at DIA has put together this um, for the past years, I should say, not only with the exhibition, but also with the parallel programs that we conceived to accompany the exhibition. And today, as you know, is the second part of a two-day symposium, which started yesterday. Some of you, I see, were here, so welcome back. And those who, today is your first day, uh, welcome. Um, I also have to thank the amazing team of colleagues that work with me, especially our Mellon Fellow, Andriana Campbell, our interns, Tim Anderson and Francesca Logalvo, who coordinated with Manuel this program, and my colleagues, Blair Barbock, Patrick Hellman, Max Tanone, Kathleen Anderson, and Susan Batten, who support behind the scenes uh, what is happening today, throughout the day. Um, Maybe, maybe you know this from the press release and from attending other programs, but it's today, right now at this moment, it's been four years since we embark on this mission of honoring um, the career of Carl Andre with a retrospective. And um, we're delighted that this program adds to that effort. We wanted, from the beginning, we were motivated to conceive a presentation of his works that allows us to see the logics of Carl's work with accuracy. We wanted to offer you, viewers, um, who we assume the majority of you have only seen one and a small amount of works, very limited amount of works of Carl's in public collections, perhaps if you're fortunate in private collections, and, but that we assume that the majority of American audiences have seen Carl's work uh, primarily as reproductions. So it was very important for us to bring a large body of work of his, and that's, that was the impetus to give you an accurate presentation of a diversity of his, of his practice. And um, you will learn this eventually in a couple of years, I hope, when the catalogue raisonné of his work comes out. Um, he produced over 2,000 sculptures and probably equal or more amounts of poetry. And as you discover in the Dada forgeries section of the exhibition, there's a, a lot more um, to Carl's practice that we are just understanding. Um, 
I wanted also to uh, mention that the symposium is part of a series of programs that were conceived to generate uh, in-depth examinations of Andrew's work and his career. Um, this goes along with the publication which accompanies the exhibition. The book was intended to introduce new voices in, in this larger conversation, and we remain grateful to Christophe Cherik, Brooke Holmes, Vincent Katz, Marjorie Perloff, Arnaud Pierre, Alistair Ryder, Annie Rorimer, Phyllis Stockman, and Mika Yoshitake, who contributed essays to the publication. And when we opened in May, last May, um, we also thought it was crucial to have experiences in the gallery in front of the work. So we put a series of programs, and maybe some of you have been fortunate to attend some of them, including um, one with the mathematician Philip Orden, the novelist um, from Vancouver, Aaron Peck, the poet Vincent Katz, who was also a contributor to the book, Manuel Sirauki here recently did a, a talk as well in the galleries. And um, um, the artist Leslie Hewitt recently gave a fantastic lecture, part of our Artists on Artists series in the city. Following this program, um, the symposium, the upcoming two programs are Stephen Hoven, who will speak in January about the influence of Greek mythology in Carl's work, and um, in February, or March, March, sorry, the last program will be artist Pierre Le Guignon. He will be coming from Brussels to speak about Carl's work in relationship, turbulent relationship with photography. I hope that you remember this and join us. Lastly, we are enormously proud obviously, to bring today two great scholars and colleagues and very instrumental figures. Um, for me, for Manuel, for Philippe, I can speak for Philippe, um, to this program, both uh, Mark Godfrey and Professor James Mayer. Um, I'm going to make a little this parenthesis here. Manuel will introduce Mark and then later Professor Mayer, but I want to um, say that Mark, from the beginning, when I mentioned casually that we were doing Carl's retrospective, he immediately was enthusiastic and, and incredibly generous to me, and I am delighted that you're here today. Um, our small conversations were very important, and it's so encouraging to have colleagues who give you that feedback immediately, and I'm grateful, personally grateful. And Professor Mayer, I have to also make a parenthesis because um, a great deal of this, the discovery of this exhibition and um, the satisfaction we got curating this show, Manuel and I um, doing the research on the Dada forgeries is thanks to you. I was one of those invisible people in the back at the Chinati lecture you gave in 2010, and I was the one taking photographs of your slides and uh, coming back and reporting to the people in the office. We have a lot of work to do on a body of work that nobody knows anything about but Professor Mayer, <laughs> James Mayer. <laughs> so I'm delighted um, that you're joining us today and that you, your research and your hard work on Carl's practice um, gave us such a lead way to be able to conceive this exhibition. Now, um, just to end, I would like to say that the, this lecture today, the symposium, is being recorded. When there's a moment for Q&A after, after Professor Mayer's lecture in the afternoon, please use the microphone, introduce yourself with your names, and also pr please turn off your phones. So I don't think that reception is that great here, but please turn it off. And if you do need, uh, because you're a scholar and you do need a copy of this lecture for research later on, you can come to me or Manuel and we'll make it available. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Yasmil. Um, thanks everybody to be here again or for the first time or for the end time um, at the Beacon for this show. Um, so we're running a little uh, bit behind schedule, so we'll go straight to the point. 
Um, as you know, the structure of the symposium, we have one talk, then lunch break, then another talk, and the panel discussion with Q&A, and hopefully we'll have time to continue seeing the show before uh, the museum closes at 4 p.m. Um, keep your blue chips. The room is technically full, although there are some empty chairs. Some people are taking different trains. So I will just introduce um, Mark Godfrey, Professor Mark Godfrey, and at the same time, Curator Mark Godfrey. Um, we're very proud to have um, Mark and, and James here today. We're, we're incredibly honored by their presence. Um, for those who are not familiar with all the facts of or some of the facts of uh, Mark Godfrey's career. He is a curator of international art at Tate Modern in London, or Tate, should I say just Tate now? Uh, <laughs> um, where he has organized major exhibitions, including recent retrospectives of Gerhard Richter, Ali Giro Boetti, Richard Hamilton, uh, this one in collaboration with the Museo Nacional uh, Centro de Arte Reina Sofia in Madrid in 2014, and Sigmar Polke in collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2014 and uh, through 2015. His criticism appears frequently in After All, Our Forum, Freeze, October, and Parquet. Um, and he is the author of Abstraction and the Holocaust, 2007. Prior to joining Tate in 2007, Godfrey um, was lecturing in history and theo uh, theory of art at the Slade School of Fine Art University College in London. Thank you, Mike, for being here. And please join me in welcoming Mike Godfrey. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I'd like to also thank uh, Yasmin and Manuel for inviting me uh, and congratulate you both and Philippe on an incredible exhibition. And um, it's brilliant to be here. There's a lot of people in the room who know Carl Andre's work a lot, a lot better than myself. Uh, and what I thought I'd therefore talk about um, is uh, some different trajectories leading out of Andre's work and actually connecting his work to some of the artists who've been part of the programs of the Dear Art Foundation. I also, before I wanted to start, just to congratulate the Dear on your appointment of your new director and say that she has been a fantastic colleague of mine at Tate. And I think you're um, extremely lucky to have Jessica Morgan. So um, this is a sort of informal talk. There's five chapters, um, five groups of responses to Andre's work. Uh, and I'm not reading it out and doing it sort of from notes. Um, so the first chapter is about instant responses. And um, I wanted to think what, what's really going on in responses by Carl Andre and, sorry, by Sigmar Polka and Boetti. I'll come to Boetti in a second. So um, it's pretty well known that uh, Andre, Andre made the first exhibition at the Conrad Fischer Gallery in Dusseldorf in 1967 with the uh, work 5 by 20 Outstat Rectangle. Uh, and at that time, Conrad Fischer, just starting in the gallery, had been, but was a, a close friend with Polka, had been um, with Polka at the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf. And so they knew each other very well. And Polka would be part of Conrad Fischer's program and have shows there a couple of years later. So uh, the year after Carl did this exhibition, Polka made the painting Carl Andre in Delft. And I want to sort of try and figure out, well, what what's this joke all about? Is it just a joke and so on? Uh, the painting, by the way, is, takes a, um, a cloth and um, so the, what looks like the Delft tiles is just printed. It's a printed fabric and um, Sigmar Polka painted a white border around it and then painted the text on top of it. To put it in a little bit of context in Polka's work, it's part of a group of works that he was doing in 1968 which have to do with thinking about uh, the reception of abstract modern, modernist art uh, in Germany in the 60s. Uh, there's the painting Moderne Kunst, which seems to sort of collapse all forms of abstraction onto one plane. And the other very famous painting, also with this sort of um, courier-type painted font, but slightly quirky here because some of the letters are slightly above the line. Um, and the translation is higher powers command, paint in the upper right corner black. So Polka in 68 is thinking a lot about abstraction and if abstraction is all washed up, if it's just an empty set of conventions. But the only work he does which really sort of targets contemporary abstraction is this work. 
And I'm sort of trying to figure, is this just merely a joke painting about Andre, or is there something more to it? And in a way, I think there's something more to it because Polka understands what is significant in Andre's work, that Andre hadn't shipped the work from the States to Dusseldorf, but had, like, um, found or you know, sourced these plates from Dusseldorf, had come to Europe with, with nothing and had made the work there. And so, you know, the joke is, well, if he then goes to Delft, he would therefore use the materials found in Delft. But at the same time, I think Andre's suggesting that this practice of using local resources isn't just new. It's not something that Andre's done that hasn't been done before. And he himself gets his materials from local places and continued to do that throughout his career. Well, sometimes he would ship paintings, but other times he would find fabrics in places where he was having an exhibition. Um, I mean, it's interesting that the next stop, and Linda probably talked about this yesterday, but the, the next stop that Andre made was exactly to the Netherlands, and was, that was for the, um, the big minimal art show, I think, in the Gemente Museum. So the, the idea of going from Dusseldorf to Delft was not at all inconceivable. It was, in fact, what actually was happening. But I think the other part of the... This may be the kind of critical uh, element to uh, Polka's painting, is the suggestion that what might have looked radical in Andre's practice, so the gridding of, you know, um, plates on the floor as a sort of anti-compositional way of making a sculpture, were, Polka reads that just as a kind of something that's in the line of other decorative art through the ages and Delft t tiling, of course. I mean, Andre wouldn't have used these tiles, but the, the joke is kind of that, well, the idea of placing things together and forming a grid is, which seems radical in Andre is perhaps no, that, not that so much different from a t decorative tiling in um, Delft. One thing I'm, I don't know, and I'm sort of going to throw out some questions here for discussion later, is whether uh, Andre's, uh, Polka's use of this particular font to paint the letters Carl Andre and Delft had any relationship to the font in Andre's poems and whether they had been at all exposed to the Dusseldorf audience. I'm not quite sure about that. And the other thing I wanted to say about this was just I'm not sure whether Andre, whether Polka is, is thinking at all critically about Andre's title at, using the word outstart, and this is something, again, I don't know, if, whether everyone refers to that area as the old city or whether um, Polka saw in Andre a kind of exoticism about old Europe, that Andre might have been sort of very fascinated by old Europe and called the work after the old city. Uh, and, and that would be what led him to be fascinated later, could lead him later to be fascinated with Delft. Anyway, so those are questions for later. Um, the next artist, or the dialogue I want to talk about, isn't actually uh, necessarily a kind of a, a clear dialogue. It's more a kind of correspondence of works that are happening at the same time. So this is Andre's work installed at the beginning of 1969 at the Kunsthalle Bern. Um, and this is the work that Alighiera Boetti had in the same exhibition. You can see him just in the corner there laying it down. So it, I am not sure I would want to read what Boetti does as a direct reference or play on Andre, uh, because he had come up with this, um, when Attitudes Become Form would have been the first time that Boetti would have ever seen Andre's work, and he was already making this work. But what interests me is that is what Boetti does slightly differently to Andre with the idea of the floor sculpture, which is essentially um, well, two things. First of all, to imply an order that is other than to the order of the order of the grid. So you know, uh, tiles wh where, which are cut up according to uh, a, a a different set of um, coordinates from the actual outward shape of the grid. Is that clear, what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then what he does later is, is Boetti remakes the work um, and calls it Pavimento. So the first one was called Yellow Terrain, and the next one's Pavimento. So it's almost to take something in Andre and make it very literal. 
Um, uh, I think the title, it's a little unclear what the exact chronology is here, but I think that um, the title of this work, Pavimento, bless you, was um, slightly later than the actual work itself. So in a way, I think it's, some, it's something to ask whether Boetti, having seen Andre's work, wanted then to re... He did several versions of all the Arte Povera works that he made, and Arte Povera for him was a two-year period. But in that period, he made like several versions of each work. But I'm interested to think whether, having seen Andre, he then titles the work in this really literal uh, way, call a, call a pavement a pavement. If you're doing something on the floor, make it really called like the floor and refer to what we walk on all the time. Um, another correspondence in the work has to do with the relationship time-wise between the first of Andre's checkerboards, which I believe begin at the end of 1969, and um, works by Boetti, which use little metal, um, little metal kind of tiles, um, but threaded through with a very soft tissue paper. Um, now, the, again, the exhibition history here is a little complex. In the cat catalogue for When Attitudes Become Form, there were three illustrations of Boetti's works, and one of them was the first version of this work, which at the time was called La Tritella, which I think is a sort of hammering instrument to pulverise meat. Um, so Andre would have seen Boetti's work actually in the catalogue before he actually made the first of his um, checker pieces. But then Boetti makes another ver version slightly later, and this is uh, Itavallo. And what's, I think, really significant about it in relation to Andre is just the, the, the great difference. Um, Boetti thinks about a sort of soft, soft versus hard, uh, that kind of dynamic. Um, thinks much more about the game. Like if, the, if both artists are referring in some way to the checkerboard that we, of chess or drafts, Boetti involves, Boetti's work actually involves a, a game at the point of installation, where in order to uh, install the work without ripping the tissue paper, you have to install it, in, and I've seen this happen, you have to install it extremely carefully in order to make it really, really tight, but that the tissue paper doesn't rip. Uh, and these are, you know, very, very sharp edged bits of metal. So there's a game of the order of the grid and the disorder of the, the tissue paper. That play on ordine e disordine would become the main uh, dynamic in Boetti's work in the 70s. Um, but softness, hardness, but also the game of installation, which is very different from what Andre is doing at the time. So whether Boetti's work is a response or just a, an interesting point of difference, I'm not so sure. But it would be interesting to know whether Andre sort of digested the images in the When Attitudes Become Form catalogue, which would have shown this uh, checkerboard work by Boetti a little bit before he made his. The next chapter is about Carl Andre and Zoe Leonard. Um, so the first, well, Boetti is in the Deer Collection. Zoe did a magnificent installation here some years ago with um, the postcards of Niagara. And um, here I want to think, so now we're talking about a very different generation and a bit more speculative in terms of whether this is a set of responses or not. But the images might sort of help make the case. This, I'm going to talk about three sculptural works that Zoe has done. Um, the first is called um, Strange Fruit, and uh, it was also titled Strange Fruit for David, and this was made just in the aftermath of um, the death of her very close friend from AIDS, David Wojnarowicz, which I'm sure I've mispronounced as usual. But um, what I want to think about is the whether Leonard in, some, in her very few sculptural works has um, been conscious of some of the forms in Carl Andre's very famous sculptures. Here you see, um, the relation of strange fruit, which is a series of uh, the shells of fruits, uh, bananas, avocados, and oranges that are dried out and stitched together. Um, and the scatter piece, which you can see upstairs, which also has these spherical and longer forms in it. The interesting thing is that these works have been installed in the same identical spots. So this is it's the scatter piece at um, Paula Cooper's 21st Street. 
and in the very, very same room, and this was the first time, I think, that this piece was ever shown, um, the work there. Um, these two were not shown in the same spot, but here you see, again, Lever, which is upstairs, uh, first shown at the Jewish Museum, I think, and um, a piece that Zoe's made called 1961 Ongoing, which is a, a line of blue suitcases found at flea markets, um, one for every year of her life, and it's a piece that, we, that will continue to be made. And um, then, and that's a close-up of it, and then this is Carl Andre's Lament for the Children, and a, uh, the third major sculpture, uh, mouth open, teeth showing, which is more um, material from, you know, dolls that are bought at flea markets again. And here they are in the same room at Paula Cooper's gallery. So I wouldn't necessarily be talking about the formal correspondence so much, but I think it's really interesting that when Zoe was making these works in the 90s and showing them at Paula Cooper's, the ghost of, well, not the ghost, but the presence of Andre, that was the only place where you could see his work in New York. So it's not just that she's made use of those forms, but that that was a very personal thing in, in that particular community of um, artists working in that gallery. So the question really is, what, what does, she does, with, does she do with these forms? I think um, she brings out some things about the forms of minimal art that maybe were implicit. Um, with this work, I think the idea of this as a memorial, the scatter is something quite beautiful because it suggests a sort of pro a, a, an uncountability of, um, of death. And this is very much a response to the devastation of the AIDS crisis in New York in the 90s and the 80s. And I think the form of the scatter is that it very, very powerfully conveys a sense of not being able to count and the dispersal of all these, um, you know, the, the, these figures who, who have been important figures, artists, and, uh, and who are there no more. Um, so the, 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 but I think something is conveyed through this scattering that, that's very much to do with what she wanted to um, achieve, that loss in some ways cannot be organized, and so the scattering stands for that inability to, to organize loss. Um, with the line here in uh, this relationship, um, I think that the work is in some ways this very poignant, Leonard's work very poignantly um, brings out questions of what it means to become a subject. How e Each individual um, case seems incredibly um, individual. It was owned by a particular person. It was then later discarded, declared disused sent to a flea market. Um, so on their own, you would get a sense of just the connection between this object and someone who, who used to own it, who you don't know about. In a line, there's a sense of all, the, all this individuality somehow corralled, somehow um, put into a kind of order. And that there's a poignancy about that process of individuality being um, somehow organized. Um, and I think that that's what she gets, in, gets at in this work. Um, it's not just personal about the, the, the trajectory of her life with one suitcase added for each year, but something about that process of, of growing up, so the child becoming an adult and submitting to the, the ordering devices of a society. And I think that she somehow, that's not necessarily implicit in Lever at all, but that it's been a useful um, form for her to build on. And then um, here I think that the grid somehow serves as a way of focusing attention on the individuality of all these dolls. Um, but there's something also completely uh, witty and ludicrous about the, these tiny objects being. Um, being sort of set into a form that's very much associated with, uh, with ordering. Um, so, uh, but this taking of forms of minimalism and injecting them with ideas more around pathos, content, um, subjectivity is, isn't alone to Zoe Leonard's work. You see it also in um, a work by Ronnie Horn. I mean, I just put this into the show because I just went upstairs and saw the beautiful gold piece in the cabinet. And I was thinking about 
Ronnie's use of, um, of gold on the floor. And this, like Zoe Leonard's work, this was made as a, a, as a memorial work for two close friends of hers, um, Felix Gonzalez Torres and her, and his partner Ross. And again, sort of, it's two incredibly thin sheets of gold, one laid over the other, so that light catches in between them and the piece seems to be on fire. Again, a work that's been installed by Lynn Cook uh, in shows pr in, at the Deer when, uh, in Chelsea. So this, <coughs> in a, insofar as it's a floor piece and a very a sort of very thin piece, I think there's a kind of a, a way that, that also Ronnie, as well as Zoe, is sort of using some of the forms of Andre's work. So it, it, one of the things this makes me ask is how this connects up with, um, it, or do the, are the, is there anything implicit in Andre's work already that has to do with this use of minimal forms as a, in terms of subtle kinds of memorials? And I'm quite interested to know more from the experts here about the series of works that um, Andre did in 1983, which were um, in some ways, um, well, had the Eva is Eva Hess, and I think they were made in part of a, in the context of a tribute to, to Eva Hess as a, as a show there. And James, in his writing, beautifully described this piece, which I'm sorry not to have in colour, um, as trembling. So there's possibly something implicit in some of um, Andre's work that already has an aspect that's brought out more um, clearly by future artists. Um, and there's a piece I'd also like to know more about, which is a work called um, Grave for a Small Child, which was done um, in 1967 by Andre by dropping sand from the top of the step so it sort of fell in a cone. And I wondered about that title, whether it was just coincidence or casual, or whether that was, again, something that had a, a story behind it that was significant. Um, in a, in perhaps later work by Andre, there have been some of these ideas about memorialization, I think, have also been subtly present. This is a work that was first installed uh, in the synagogue Stommel in, in Germany in 1967. So the void, the idea of the cut, which of course has been present in Andre's work right from the beginning, signifies very differently when put in a synagogue in a part of Germany where there are no more Jews and the cut stands at the place in the synagogue where the, the bima or the prayer, you know, the lectern would have been. Um, this was, by the way, part of a series of commissions for that synagogue, which also included Richard Serra's The Drowned and the Saved. And before I come on to the next little chapter, just one other um, artist who has taken on some of the forms um, of Andre's works and, and used them in a very different way is uh, Francis Alice, another artist connected to the Dears program. And this is the work that uh, Francis did in London in 2004-05, where he um, dropped off these guards in different parts of the old city of London and instructed them to um, walk in uh, casually until, um, sorry, walk in, in, in military step, so not casually at all, until they found each other. And whenever they found each other, they were to find other groups until the entire eight by eight square had been united. Then they were to walk to the nearest bridge and break step halfway across that bridge. It's an incredible piece and a brilliant video. But in the book that accompanied the work, um, Francis at least made clear some of the reference points for this work. And one of them was, of course, Carl Andre. And you see he illustrated the work Fermi from uh, New York from 19. 79. Okay, the next bit's a bit embarrassing because Sharon is in the room and giving a talk on Monday night. But uh, I wanted to sort of look at a kind of correspondence between um, a work by Sharon Lockhart and, um, and Carl Andre and thinking about working class culture and shipbuilding and the, both of their interests and also in the idea of coming home. Um, a work that Sharon was born in Maine and a work that was done in Maine um, and the Quincy book. This is a quote about Quincy from 1970. 
Um, Quincy was and still is the center of shipbuilding in America, and there's a shipyard on a great back river where I saw as a young boy great plates of steel laid out in acres under the rain and the sun, rusting acres of steel plates. So in 1973, um, there was a show of uh, Andres at the Addison Gallery, um, and it was on that occasion where the Quincy book was published. The Quincy book is the sort of maybe the only photographic book produced by Andre in his career. And I'll show you an image that, from that in a moment. But as the invitation card for the show, uh, Andre asked to have printed this found image of a schooner that had been lost at sea, that had been built in Quincy and then lost at sea. So always, already here, there's a kind of poignancy to the idea that a ship built in the shipyards at Quincy had been lost. Um, and that's the back of the card. And then this show happened a couple of weeks before a show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, for which the invitation card was a, um, a little boat that had gone out um, in order to try and find the sailors who had been on that schooner um, and that they hadn't been able to recover um, anyone. Um, it, was, it was set out to recover bodies, actually. Um, and this is the back of the postcard uh, that was sent back to the Addison Gallery by Andre to Chris Cook, who curated the show at the Addison. So Andre was thinking a lot about shipbuilding and the fate of um, ships in, uh, at the point that he was making this exhibition at the Addison. And he had the opportunity to work on an artist book and published the Quincy book. And in the Quincy book, I'm sure many people in here know it because you've all come to Carl Andre symposium, but what interests me is the images in that book of the shipyards that are done the, not within the shipyards, but looking in, uh, and the fact that you see no one working, and they look almost desolate. So um, I googled what was going on in the um, Quincy shipyard around 1973. So here's from Wikipedia, that great resource. During the end of 1971, the yard was faced with declining contracts, which created rumors that the yard was close to closing. The yard was in discussion to gain a $300 million equivalent to $2.4 billion in today's dollars contract for six supertankers, which would carry 65 US gallons of crude oil each. These tankers were supposed to be constructed with a 43% subsidy from the federal government, which was granted. Eventually, though, funding fell through and construction did not proceed on the ships. In other words, the year that Andre is thinking about shipbuilding in Quincy is a year where the shipbuilding industry is in crisis. And, it looks, and so it's not coincidental that he makes images of the shipyard without the workers, because this is a year where it looks like there isn't going to be any more work there. Um, now, um, many years later, in another part of New England, um, Sharon Lockhart decided to make a work, and it came out of a long process of um, a long process of research at the um, at the Bath Ironworks, uh, which are in Bath in Maine. And the end point of the research was a, a film, um, the first film that is uh, digitally projected or digitally uh, is not on 16 millimeter. Um, and uh, a series of photographs, both of um, the the boxes that the workers used to, to, to have their lunch, and of um, the businesses that are set up within the uh, within the shipyard to to sell things to, to fellow workers, <coughs> and. Um, just to describe, I think part of the research that Sharon Lockhart did was to think about the fate of the lunch break, the lunch break which would have been the moment of a communal um, coming together, uh, but uh, which increasingly under pressures to rationalize everything people, people, and to keep production going throughout the whole of the working day. The idea of having your whole workforce coming together for lunch break was being un un was threatened, and so instead of people having lunch together, there's a, in the film you see people having lunch very separately. Um, and uh, what happens in the film is, is, is I think it was shot over a period of time that might have been eight, ten minutes, and then slowed down um, uh, by many, many factors. So it's um, a very, very, very s slow uh, 
trajectory down this corridor. The trajectory in some ways connects up to some of the forms in Andre's sculptures. You see one of the very long works up there where you walk along the sculpture. But of course, there are, there are in, in terms of the period of the late 60s, there are other references in the film, I think, to works like Michael, uh, Michael Snow's Wavelength. Um, I think in the film what happens is um, you get a strange sense of the workers being very separate from each other, isolated, uh, and also the, 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 the direction of the camera, which is moving just on one simple trajectory and is never turning to look at the things that are happening, so the people who are eating lunch. That is such a powerful trajectory that you get a sense of the, the work is somehow being ignored, uh, a logic of the filming that is taking place with no, um, with no attention to the kind of people who are actually uh, present within it. Um, and that suggests a sort of a logic of surveillance and of efficiency rather than of care for the people who are actually working in these works. So in, in some sense, I think there's a kind of connection between what Andre was doing in 73, thinking about the threat to working class life in Quincy, where he was from, and um, this project by Sharon Lockhart, thinking about the threats to the culture of working class life in, in Maine, where, sh where she uh, uh, comes from. Um, and something else that interests me, because of the way it's shot, is, uh, is that the people in the film, sometimes when they're moving very slowly, there's a slight pixelation, and at their very edges, the, the, they, they seem to almost kind of dissolve into pixels. It's very interesting. It's the first time this would have happened in Sharon Lockhart's work, because prior works were all shot uh, on analog. But that becoming, the, the body becoming somehow disintegrated into pixels, I would say like the, pic, like the grids of Andre's works, but that would be a bit too corny. But that, that, um, that fate of the body is another kind of premonition of the replacement of bodies with other um, maybe more efficient ways of making, uh, making things like ships. This is another still. And um, these beautiful series of photographs, just two of them, which are these you know, wonderful portraits of the lunch boxes of the, and, and named after the, the people um, who were working at that, at the Bath Shipworks. Okay, so the next chapter is called Matterists Today. And um, it interests me that um, Carl Andre has said that my vocation is to be a matterist. And this idea of being a matterist rather than a sculptor, I think, comes up really, really um, powerfully in the exhibition. When I walked through the exhibition some months ago with Yasmiel, I had this amazing sense of just the difference between steel, you know, magnesium and copper, or carbon and copper, or wood, and a, a real sense of matters mattering for um, Andre. And of course, then later on reading the reading texts in the book that James Meyer has edited, you see that this is a really, really powerful um, aspect of, of, of his writings. And Andre wanted to connect his interest in matter to questions of industry, to working class culture. My work derives from the working craft cl crafts, cr cl class crafts of bricklaying, tile setting, and stone masonry reflects on the conditions of industrial production, and so on. So he did want to think that the experience of a viewer having a sense of matter would also, in some ways, make them think about larger questions of industry. And at times, he claimed that there was a, um, a, polit a political position to this. Matter as matter, rather than as matter as symbols, is a conscious political position, I think, essentially Marxist and went on to think about the contradictions of the fact that he wanted to think about his work as socialist art, but absolutely recognition, recognized that the work was reliant on a system of galleries and of um, patrons and collectors, and so that there was no getting away from capitalism in his practice. He's also conscious of the fact that materials change over the course of his life, that some materials that he used to work with are no longer available. Um, 
and uh, likes somehow to retain materials that he says are disappearing from everyday life, like copper kettles, for instance. Um, so in his work, there's a lot of thinking about matter and the connection of matter to industry and to changes in industry. Uh, but, there's, but, but those things are all quite implicit if you actually think about the actual works themselves. They get more explicit in the statements about the work, but they're implicit in the works. And it makes me um, ask the question about what, where these inquiries go towards today and how artists and almost, this is almost like a group of artists coming out of the idea who, who may be matterists today. Not all of them are sculpture, sculptors, there are some of them making films. Um, but how matter matters for artists today. So here we start with the aluminium square from 1968. And um, this exhibition um, cuts. And that's an introduction to think about an artist who's used the cut and aluminium in a series of projects, and that's Simon Starling. So when Simon Starling did a show at De Appel some years ago in, in the Netherlands, he took the opportunity to think about the relationship between the Netherlands and its former colonies. And he went to Suriname. And Suriname is a place where um, aluminium, or you know, I think it's bauxite, is mined. So <coughs> when he went to the Netherlands, he um, did, did uh, he, he rode on a river in an aluminium uh, boat. And while he was on the river, he um, collected solar energy on the river. <coughs> And um, with the power from the solar energy, when he got back to um, the Netherlands, he then cut the boat and um, suspended it from the ceiling. So some, you, you have a kind of a sense of the cut of the boat here. Um, and the, the, the second section of the boat that wasn't suspended was then remelted melted down to form a replica of a lump of bauxite that he had um, that he had uh, found or mined when he was in visiting Suriname. Um, this sort of uh, trajectory is, is quite common to Starling's works, where, which often involve voyages and absurd acts of long transportation and refabrication and so on. But what I think is significant here is that thinking about aluminium for Starling is also about thinking about colonialism, it's thinking about the, where aluminium actually comes from, how come aluminium comes from certain countries, what's the history that interested European countries in certain countries that are far from Europe, and so on. Um, and when you uh, think, when you, when you look at this work, you have to take on board those questions of international uh, trade and, uh, and the history of trade when, when you encounter the work. Those are things, I think, which are sort of implicit in Andre explicit later on. Um, another work made using aluminium, but it's, I think I, I'm, I'll come on to the next person. The next person I want to talk about was um, Lucy Raven. And I'll introduce her by showing the copper square from 1967. So um, Lucy Raven has produced in 2009 uh, an absolutely amazing I would call it a film, but it's, it's an animation, and it's called Chinatown, and it's, I think, 51 minutes, and it's made up of thousands of stills. Um, and the film starts in, at a copper mine in Nevada, and you, in the process of the 50 minutes, you see the mining of copper or copper ore, the shipping of the ore to uh, a, a major port on the east coast, on the west, sorry, west coast of um, North America, a section where you're on the boat, and then you arrive in China, and it's in China where the um, where the copper is refined into copper plates, and the copper plates, of course, are then later milled or stretched into the copper wires. One of the things she was interested in was this idea of the wireless society uh, as a complete, um, you know, a complete myth. The idea that we are now wireless, I mean, I've got internet reception over here, is for her a, a ridiculous idea. And of course, um, we're all reliant on materials as, as much as we ever were. And so thinking about copper, which of course is used all the time in, in our wires, was a way to really think what, what are the material um, aspects of trade and life today that 
that allow us to think ourselves wireless. So it's, again, it's a focus on um, production, the relationship of the, of the West to the East, and so on. I don't know, I mean, I, I'd like, if possible, just to show a clip from this, but I, I know we're running over time, but maybe there's a, I mean, I think it would be interesting if we... Okay. Um, um, right. Uh, that's the wrong one. Okay. I knew it would be a bit like this. <laughs> but just it's important to get a sense of... Um, how this film looks. I'm going to move it to a bit which is in the China section. Now my computer's having a hard time with this. Sorry for the break. Well... One of the things that interests me about the film is its structure is in some way akin to lever. It's you know, a series of images placed in a very, very long line, and the line is a line that reaches from the United States, from the mine, to China. Um, and the question is, well, why did she want to show the footage like this rather than in a continuous way? I think in some ways that the decision to use the footage like this allows one to think about the labor of her making it um, and the labor of the, the artist just as much as you're looking at images of other people's labor. There's a, a moment in a little bit where you just see this image of... Oh, here we go. So um, another artist who I think has dealt with related questions is Steve McQueen. And um, I was looking at the table of uh, the periodic table that appears at the back of the exhibition catalogue and the, the amazing um, charting of all the different materials that Andre has used in his career. But one of the materials I don't think he's used is coltan. Um, and uh, I can't, for the, at the moment, remember the correct uh, name for coltan, but it's the, the, a metal which is used in um, all of our mobile phones and in various electronic equipment today. And thinking about coltan, Steve McQueen made a work called Gravesend, which I will not project any of, but it begins with um, the, the uh, refining of coltan in a, um, I think, somewhere in the UK. Uh, and you, you have this incredibly precise footage of um, robotic arms pouring the liquid over here and the liquid metal um, solidifying in grids. 
Again, kind of grids not so far away from the appearance of Andre's grids. Um, but there's no humans present at all. And then the, you move through a se sequence which looks at the port of Gravesend, very much associated with uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, very beautiful footage. And of course, that, that site is the, the shipping point from London to Africa. And the next a series of, um, series of uh, the next part of the film looks at the mining of coltan, and the sound is incredibly important in this work. You really get a, a powerful sense of violence almost through the sound, and that sound might help one think about the violence that has, is happening in, in the Congo because of the mining of coltan. So without ever specifically pointing to that, McQueen's film invokes um, the, 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 the effects of the desire um, for minerals and, and metals today. Uh, and this is a part of the world that, that, where there's been extreme um, violence and fighting over the control of resources to, to the metals. Here's a, another image from it. Um, but of these matterists, so I've talked about Lucy Raven, Steve McQueen, Simon Starling. The, 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 the last uh, in this bit of the talk I wanted to talk about was about Sam Lewitt. And when I was reading um, the catalogue, I, I, I came across a quote in Anne Rorimer's essay um, by Andre, which, in which he wanted to really separate his work from conceptual art. So he said, a work of conceptual art has to do with a work of material art, the way a stock certificate has to do with a steel mill. There are whole generations of people who invest in steel and never see the steel, steel mill, but they have a portfolio of these papers which which are proofs of ownership. I'm much more interested in the steel mill. I'm not interested in the stock exchange certificate at all. And this was an interesting quote for me to think about because I think many artists thinking about matter today would understand that it's impossible to disassociate the mill from the stock exchange and that to think about matter today, you have to consider it's, it, the function of matter in circuits of, um, of trade, um, global circuits of trade, finance and so on. And I think um, an artist who's particularly concerned with this is Sam Lewitt. So this is an installation that uh, he made at the, at the Whitney Biennial. Um, and it was an inst installation made with magnets that are found in hard drives and ferromagnetic fluid, which is a fluid that when uh, fanned becomes um, solid. And over the course of the installation, he would pour more of this fluid onto the ground and it would crystallize um, into these amazing shapes and then become fluid once again. Uh, and um, this, he, his research into materials are, is a research into the materials that um, allow finance to take place, allow the, the communi communications of, at speed to take place. Um, they are the materials that are found within computer hard drives and so on. Um, in another series of works called Stalled Value Field Separators, where again, the, you know, the linear forms of uh, Andre's work like Lever have been somehow, um, I think, present. Uh, he takes magnets that have a particular function in hard drives and lines them up um, with credit cards, uh, thinking about the, the metals which are in the magnetic strips in credit cards. The magnets destroy the credit cards and make them dysfunctional. So the idea of the, the work is not only about um, you know, the, 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 the metals that are used in computers to facilitate trade and global commerce, but the work, in fact, sort of in some ways destroys that in its very um, coming together because the credit cards are destroyed. But the show that I wanted to talk, sort of mainly talk about was an exhibition that's on right now in New York, and I urge you to go see it. It's at Miguel Abreu's gallery. Um, and it's very interesting in relation to Andre because of what, what Sam does with copper as opposed to what Carl Andre does with copper. For Sam, I was talking to him the other day, you, copper is always copper grafted onto plastic. It's never copper on itself, and copper grafted onto plastic because that's what copper is. That's how copper works in um, circuits. And you know, if you open up the computer, you'd find copper grafted onto plastic. Or if you open up my mobile phone, you'd find copper grafted onto plastic. He, so he's thinking about copper. He's also thinking about the floor. 
In this exhibition, to describe it very quickly, he decided to find a way of mapping the space of the Miguel Abru Gallery so that you could locate each point in that gallery where you would get an image of the entire gallery space. It's a gallery which has many different rooms and corridors, but he used the computer algorithm to locate the various points in the space which would allow you to survey the whole space. And so the floor plan for him is, the floor is never just the floor, the floor is connected to questions of surveillance and um, sort of digital mapping. He then um, got a router to make a diagram of the floor in these sheets of copper, which are the copper laid onto plastic. But it was a router that can't quite handle the thinness of the copper, and so there are many mistakes um, in, in its routing. These are positioned at points in the gallery which are connected to the points which, where they are, um, which they map. So in each of the sheets, there's a portion of the, of the map which is erased out. Um, sorry. So what I mean talking about this bit over there in the top corner, um, over here, it's sited at the part of the gallery where that corresponds to. And this bit over here is cited in the part of the gallery where that bit corresponds to. So uh, as you encounter copper here, um, and I'm not quite doing justice to the, to the thinking here, um, the work is connecting you to ways of surveilling gal gallery space and to the functions of copper in, in, in circuit boards. And whereas copper in circuit boards is very much to do with creating very smooth, efficient processes, these works in some way interrupt that efficiency and the way in which they're made is, makes you tend to sort of a screwing up of that smoothness of flow of information and capital. Right, so now I'm on just to the, I've got a couple more minutes and I just wanted to talk about the, uh, the last sort of chapter which is thinking about Jan Vo and Carl Andre. And I particularly, I was in, you know, one of Carl Andre's most important statements about sculpture um, concerns, and I, I'm not sure if this is the, the correct date for passport, is it? Okay, concerns the Statue of Liberty. So very famously, he said that, you know, you can almost think about the history of sculpture in three chapters. First of all, people that were interested in sculpture's image, um, so the image of the Statue of Liberty, then um, in, or, or then in sculpture as structure, so eyefuls of scaffolding within the Statue of Liberty. But what he's interested in is sculpture as place. So sculpture that gives you a sense of place when you're on it and, and how, for instance, the, the place of, um, of the island in the New York Bay is what sculptors of his generation are really attending to. Um, now, it, the, his work were, Al, um, Alistair Ryder writes very interestingly about what place really means in Andre's work and the fact that they're never permanent places, that the way in which the work is made is that a place is established by the laying down of, for instance, me um, metal tiles, but never fixed, never fixed to the floor. So it's not about a, a permanent sense of place, but almost a fragile sense of place that's established for as long as the sculpture is, in, is installed, but one knows when one encounters the work that that is only temporary, that the plates will be taken up off the floor and that place that was there in the gallery for some time where you may, standing on the work, have a very sensitized sense of your place in that architectural space in the world, that is impermanent and transient because the work will be packed up um, rather than the site-specific work of, say, uh, Richard Serra, which was anchored to a particular place. Anyway, as many of you might know, in the last few years, Jan Vos worked on a project called We the People, which also takes as its starting point the Statue of Liberty. Um, but uh, when um, and, and but again, in the way in which the work is presented, um, another work with copper. In the, in the label, for instance, the other day there was one of these works was installed at Humex and I was looking at the, the label and it, the label indicates that the copper is produced in China. So first of all, Vo makes you think about, absolutely think about what copper is today and who is making copper. And it was a team of um, craftsmen in China who he instructed to 
create these um, copper forms. And he is making the entire Statue of Liberty. But the other important part of the work is that the entirety is never shown in one space. So this is an installation where there's many fragments. Um, but in other exhibitions, you'll just see one fragment, one fragment of the, I'm not sure how many there are in total. Um, so uh, the question of place is figured very, very differently in this work. Um, one, of course, has to think about what, what it means to take apart the Statue of Liberty what, and what the promise of liberty and American liberty meant and the failure of that promise and the spread of the failure of that promise all over the world in the last, particularly in the last 15 years. Um, but also I think as in much of his work, this is an artist who would not really be ever thinking about place as something that's solid or permanent, but place is always filtered through personal experience, which isn't his alone, of displacement. So um, on a biographical note, he was born in Vietnam, grew up in Denmark, now lives between Berlin and Mexico City and New York and other places, constantly mobile. But displacement comes into um, many people's lives today. So for a, I think what's significant about the work is that um, it really raises in a very powerful way the idea of displacement because of the fact that it refers to a particular place we all know, but also makes impossible the idea that the whole sculpture will in any one point be in any single place. So in a very um, poetic way, what place means here is, is continual displacement. Um, and I think that's where I'll end, so thank you very much. All right, so welcome back to the Calander Symposium, the second part today, very exciting day for all of us. Um, I would need a, a long time to introduce Professor James Meyer, and, um, and I very much look forward to his talk on the Calanders that are forged. It's a very, um, a very new body of work for many of us, even those who have research them and hunt them down for uh, a few years now. Um, Professor James Mayer, Mayer is Associate Curator of Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and Adjunct Professor of Art History at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He is the author of Minimalism, Art and Polemics in the 60s, and editor of Katz, Text 1959-2004, published in 2005, uh, an anthology of Carl Andres' writings. In addition to his influential work on Andres' sculpture and poetry, Meyer has written on Mel Bogner, Andrea Fraser, Eva Hesse, Howard Hodgkin, uh, Hodgkin, Ellsworth Kelly, and Anne Truitt, among others. His essays have appeared in Art Forum, where he's a contributing editor, Grey Room, and October. I can only say how much uh, we're honored to having, uh, of having uh, Professor Meyer uh, here today. Um, from whom we have learned so much. I think minimalism, uh, his book uh, on minimalism is, uh, has been a textbook for, for many of us, uh, young curators, young art historians, um, for, for, for all these years. And um, um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that we keep learning from his uh, projects as a, as a scholar and also a curator. Um, we were just talking about, um, uh, I think, a seminar show um, on institutional critique he created in the 90s, uh, what happened to inst institutional critique. And um, so, yeah, I'm very honored. Thank you, Professor Meyer, for being with us, and please join me in welcoming him to the Thank you so much, Manuel. Uh, delighted to be here, and um, I want to salute the exhibition uh, that uh, you have made here at DIA. It's the first really complete view of Carl's work um, that's been made in a very long time, and it's allowed us to see things we haven't seen before. Uh, and Carl's work is vast, as we know, and thanks to this show, we uh, have learned things that um, are 
we keep learning from Carl's art, but we really, this show forces us to see things we haven't seen. And one of the aspects of the work that hasn't really been seen is the work I'll talk about today, the Dada forgeries. Um, and I should say that uh, there's no literature on this work. Um, the work uh, that I'm going to present is very speculative. And um, I know that Carl is here today, so um, I may be getting some things wrong. So I will, I will appreciate um, uh, responses, perhaps, from Carl himself um, afterwards. So the standard narrative of, of uh, Carl's progression uh, is one demonstrated by the show, and Mark Godfrey uh, spoke about it before. It's the narrative that uh, Carl has spoken about, a transition from shaped sculpture sculpture uh, from the ancients, perhaps through Rodin, to a structural sculpture um, we might associate with the constructivists, to uh, sculpture as place, which uh, Carl uh, really feels um, is his contribution. And the show is called Sculpture as Place. And Mark showed us, of course, this page from Passport, this talismanic book that uh, Carl made in 1960. <laughs> Uh, demonstrating those three um, terms of, of sculpture, the history of sculpture and also the history of Carl's sculpture. It is a narrative that encompasses his own exercises and carving in the late 50s. There's the last ladder in this exhibition from Tate. There were other ladders that Carl made carving into wood. Of course, behind that you see uh, a Stella aluminum painting. And of course, the next phase might be uh, the pyramids um, from this period, um, where Carl is notching uh, pieces of wood and um, actually building the sculpture structurally. Uh, the structure is produced um, by the process of notching and, and vice versa. To this progression to um, no longer notching things, but stacking in the uh, Tibor de Nage show in a townhouse on the Upper East Side in 65 to a work like Rodin, which was also, of course, exhibited at Tibor de Nage, um, a solution that Carl came up with. He had made, of course, a, a vertical work uh, called Well of, of stacked timber pieces, and the mass of that sculpture was so intense that he spread them laterally on the floor and came up with Rodin. And that's, of course, a picture of, of this show. Two, of course, the horizontal sculpture uh, that Carl uh, is particularly known for, exemplified by Lever, a sculpture that uh, admits gravity um, into um, its form, that's not stacked, that's placed right on the floor, and of course, as we know, reveals the floor, the surroundings, the spectator is conscious of herself in this, this place. And when Carl goes outdoors in a work like Seacant, um, you really see this idea of sculpture as place, a sculpture that can lead you through a place. There's a lot to say about sculpture as place. Carl's spoken about his art as, as, as a road, uh, a path, and sculpture as place can lead your body from one part of a place to another. It's a narrative that uh, Carl has often spoken about Brancusi as an important forebear, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute the endless column, particularly the repeated units that are carved, that looking at a work like that could lead to the uh, early uh, carved sculptures, and that ultimately um, the separation of units, the clastic units, one after the next, um, on the floor, he's remarked that you know he's sort of putting the endless column on the floor. He said that to David Borden in early essay, The Raised Sights of Carl Andre. So that's the narrative of Carl's art, and it's a powerful narrative, a compelling narrative. This show demonstrates the narrative, and uh, any scholar of Carl's work is going to contend with that narrative. I've uh, narrated that narrative. Um, but there is a category of, of Carl's work that, that doesn't fit into the narrative, and it's these, these works um, that have rarely been exhibited, never in museum shows that I know of. They were last really exhibited at Julian Preto's gallery in the early 90s. Um, Julian was uh, a dealer who had a, a very good space, and Carl would show these things there in the early 90s. 
which was also the time that I met Carl and saw these things and, and was always intrigued by these things. And uh, they aren't things that Carl uh, would perhaps describe as his formal works or even perhaps his works. Um, yet these things exist. And he's made them from very early in his career to very recently. As we see with Amara, uh, a temporary work that Hollis Frampton photographed in 1959, to uh, a work from 2002 in this show, Foot Candle. So what are these things? How do they fall within the spectrum of this prolific, extraordinary artist practice, uh, a practice that we tend to think of as divided into sculpture and poetry. Uh, what does it mean to forge Dada, the title Dada Forgeries, and uh, for Carl Andre to be a forger? Uh, these works occupy, it seems to me, a space between the sculptural and perhaps the poetical, the material and the metaphorical, or the, the non-linguistic and the um, linguistic. They sit uneasily in standard narratives of Andre's work, uh, for they depart rather blatantly from uh, the techniques that we associate with his work. Um, in these works, the serial classic uh, techniques of the bona fide sculpture are discarded, and the paratactic repetitions of words and fugal structures of the poems are also avoided. So there's different formal a uh, set of formal operations at play in these works. Elements that are put into sort of unlikely combinations, perhaps with the addition of a word or two, and often a signature uh, by Carl, who doesn't, as we know, sign the bona fide sculptures. Those are accompanied by certificates. But in these things, uh, Carl Andre will actually sign these objects. It's a kind of inversion of that. Um, strategy. And they have these evocative titles, the sign of immortality. Um, you don't see those sorts of titles in, in Carl's works, which tend to be much more descriptive um, of, of the materials, uh, the, the, the numerical structure, perhaps. Um, the titles here are rather fancy, even at times pretentious. And I think um, uh, uh, making fun of pretentiousness, of course. Another interesting aspect in a work like this is it could fall down. And of course, Carl is not Richard Serra making props. He, but this thing is not a stable form. It's not uh, respecting uh, the gravity. It, it could, because of gravity, fall. But uh, it's poised, in a sense, in, in a funny place between wall and floor. So this leads to another uh, issue with the Dada forgeries, different from the bona fide sculpture and the, the bona fide poetry. Uh, the, ludus, the ludic aspect of these works, that they are often funny. Um, and if you know Carl Andre, he has a very fine sense of humor. A um, uh, sense of humor is very particular to him. Um, he, he will often um, bring up puns and sorts of turns of phrase. Um, and it seems to me that these works channel an aspect of Carl's sensibility that we don't often see in other works. And they, they elicit a kind of amusement through these combinations of unlikely things, um, which we might describe as meta metonymy and metaphor, depending on the work. Metonymy, of course, being the associations of things, metaphor being a structure, semantic structure of substitution. You see these different sorts of structures in these works, and the humor is somehow embedded in those structures of combination. In short, these works are witty. There is a wit to these works, and, and you feel Andre's, Carl's wit, it seems to me, in these works. So the 
the serial and classic arrangements of the classic works of Carl Andre, um, we all know are an attempt to move beyond the kind of compositional part-by-part -part techniques of late modernist sculpture of sculptors like David Smith and Antony Caro, a structure of arrangement which finds its corollary in the paratactic repeated arrangements of words in the poems. These tactics treat matter as matter, and Mark Godfrey spoke about uh, Carl wanting to describe himself as a matterist, and the stress on the material substance, whether of the brick or of the signifier of the word. Uh, these, these, once you separate the unit, you focus on its material substance. They are, in the poems, printed matter, as Robert Smithson would say. Here, in these, and, and in those works, oftentimes, personal associations are um, sometimes evacuated from the work. Um, they are sometimes described as anti-subjective, desubjectivizing, and the minimal operation is tended to be described as a desubjectivizing of the work of art, a kind of liquidation of feeling, of narrative, of everything extraneous to the material substance of, of the arrangement. An art of negation. Carl has spoken about minimalism, if one is going to even use that word, which most artists of that uh, uh, period didn't like. He would say it's getting rid of dross. It's getting rid of the unnecessary, the extraneous. And certainly these works, compared to the Dada forgeries, are advanced. They are uh, revolutionary. This is a revolutionary art, Carl Andre's art. And, 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 and Mark was showing all the artists today who we could trace to, who might be affected by what Carl achieved in the bona fide sculpture. They're, I would say, revolutionary sculptures. Well, if they're revolutionary, then the Dada forgeries are regressive. They look backwards at Dada and surrealism, at that heritage. They have, at times, a regressive, almost childish humor. They are works made in the spirit of Dada. And I think it's very important to think of somebody of Carl's generation as somebody for whom Dada and surrealism is not that far away. Um, it's historical, but it's not totally past. And the lightness, the wit that we see in these works, it seems to me that they have the spirit of Dada in them. <laughs> T.J. Clark, in his book, Farewell to an Idea, says, modernism is our antiquity. It's so far away, we can't even imagine it. And I would say that in the 60s, modernism is not so far away. It's a more immediate kind of channeled past. So these works are closer in spirit to Dada, it seems to me, than the more explicit appropriations of a subsequent generation, the, the appropriations of a Sherry Levine, for example, or a Chaim Steinbeck, which, to my thinking, lack the wit um, and the humor of historical Dada, the irreverence that we see in Carl's Dada forgeries. Um, these works are not copies, they're not appropriations. Um, they are, if you will, bad Dada works. Um, forgeries, um, inadequate Dada works, uh, they're sort of bad Dada and bad surrealist works. They uh, don't have the heaviness, the portentousness of a Sherry Levine appropriation of Duchamp. Rather, as I said, they have the spirit of Dada uh, but yet they're less, they're less than the historical Dada. They're sort of entropy of Dada. They are uh, poor imitations. They are authentically inauthentic. And I think that Carl declares their inauthenticity by signing these works with his name. Therefore, he, I would say, is an honest forger. They're honest forgeries. He's not trying to pass them off as 
as real data works. And if they lack the, the power of the classic works, um, they, they have their own specificity and interest. And they provide a vantage for looking at, I would say, the other work and at minimal art in general, as you'll see. So how does Carl Andre start to make these things? It's always very interesting to look at the 12 dialogues that Carl um, wrote with Hollis Frampton in 62-63, um, collected in a, a volume that some of you know that Buchlow edited for Nova Scotia. And in that uh, 12 dialogue series, um, they go to Philadelphia, and they go to look at the Ahrensburg collection. And it seems to me that in that text, we start to see the revolutionary and the regressive, as I described it. I would also say the two paths that they're encountering of modernism, of Brancusi and Duchamp. When you go to see the Ahrensburg collection, these two towering figures of modernism are present. And so Carl is, it seems to me, facing two paths. The path of Duchamp, the path of Dada, which was dominant, of course, in 62, uh, with Johns and Rauschenberg and Cage and Cunningham, the excessive reception of Duchamp at that time, which only grows through the 60s with the Duchamp retrospective in 63 at Pasadena, the Cordian Ekstrom Duchamp show in 65 in New York. Um, to take the path of Brancusi, as Carl does, is a minority position. Uh, a minority of one, Carl Andre, um, takes this path. And we all know who have studied Carl that he comes to Brancusi uh, through his friendship with Hollis Frampton, his high school roommate, who of course was a follower of Ezra Pound and, and spends time with Ezra Pound at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where Pound, of course, is interred because he, he, he identified with the fascists in World War II, so he was a traitor according to the government, and he was put in St. Elizabeth's Hospital uh, for the mentally ill, and Hollis Frampton went down there and listened to him read the odes and spent time with him. And it was through the mediation of Frampton, Carl has often said, that he came to think about Brancusi because Ezra Pound uh, wrote very significant early texts in the teens about Brancusi's sculpture, in which Pound is really talking about the materiality of the Brancusi pedestal, the Brancusi sculpture. And I think that Carl found a great sympathy with that text, those texts of Pound. So the path of Brancusi will lead to the signature sculpture of Carl and to the narrative of sculpture as place. And you just look at Arch in Philadelphia and you really uh, can see uh, the connection with Carl's timber pieces um, in terms of the material, if not the way the material is being used. So in the 12 dialogues, we start to see Carl speak about Duchamp. In this Philadelphia text, he has things to say about Duchamp, and I want to trace some of his responses to Duchamp. We don't think of Carl and Marcel Duchamp, but actually he has very interesting things to say about Duchamp. And he initially talks about the bicycle wheel, um, which was not in Philadelphia yet. It, it entered the collection in 64, but it's obviously a very famous piece. And this is what Carl says about the bicycle wheel. He says, the bicycle wheel and the strut inserted upright into the stool is to my mind with the glass of absinthe of Picasso, one of the great sculptures of our time. Very complimentary about the bicycle wheel. But in the same dialogue, he starts to speaks somewhat deprecatingly about Duchamp. You start to feel the Dada forgery uh, sensibility here, where he says, Duchamp's taste in materials is nothing short of exquisite, up to and including his taste in urinals. Rodin and Duchamp are both sentimentalists. Duchamp is sentimental about materials. That is one of the essentials of Dada. What Carl means by sentimentality about materials, um, we could think about, but there's certainly a sense that um, he sees the urinal as exquisite, as too pretty, um, 
as uh, refined. Um, and of course, there's a whole history of the reception of the ready-made, and, and they, as much has been said about for all of Duchamp's efforts to, to find things in the hardware store that were, as he said, indifferent or not meticulous, these things by the 60s had started to appear not indifferent at all, but aesthetically um, charged, in part because they're being additioned and marketed. One thing I would want to add is that Carl's education uh, included an encounter with Dada Surrealism, the Dada Surrealist object. Uh, Carl has said that at Andover in high school, his art teacher, Patrick Morgan, um, taught a course uh, that led from the cave paintings to the fur-lined teacup. And so the Merritt Oppenheim uh, Dada Surrealist object, luncheon and fur, something Carl knew about, it seems to me, um, before the trip to Philadelphia. And of course, the object, there's a whole vast history to the objects and the, the what is the border between the Dadaist object and the surrealist object was very porous at the time, despite Breton's attempts to taxonomize them. Um, in the display case at the Charles Raton Gallery in 36, um, you have both the bottle rack sort of in the middle, and luncheon and fur was below. So already in that history, there's this kind of blurring of these types of objects. And I bring this up because it seems to me Carl's daughter forgeries draw from what we might call a surrealist uh, combination of these two things to make them strange or to elicit a uh, kind of dream um, work versus the unassisted ready-made versus the assisted ready-made, all these sort of different variations on the object. It seems to me Carl's daughter forgeries sort of draw on that ambiguity. And so Amara, a work that um, you know, was temporary, photographed by Frampton, a work that of course uh, alludes to the great uh, painting by David of the revolutionary Marat in the bathtub where he'd just been killed by Charlotte Corday, um, you know, is totally enlisting a tactic we might think of uh, from surrealism. I show you the lobster telephone of Dali. It's also an interest in the obsolete, the, the phone that um, is kind of out of date, and rendering that out of date, obsolete phone unusable by you know, drowning it. So here already you see the kind of humor and wit that I associate with Dada and certain surrealism. I think it's interesting to think about Carl Andre and Dan Flavin, uh, two of the really extraordinary artists that, we, that come to be called, despite themselves, minimalists. Because Flavin is very interested in Dada too. In fact, I would say a bit more so. And uh, he was very interested in Motherwell's volume, The Dada Painters and Poets, which had been published in 51. And he starts to make these very curious, witty things, these flower pot and uh, uh, tomato can sculptures, which he shows um, very early on, like East New York Shrine where you have a bottle, excuse me, a can of Pope brand tomatoes, I think it still exists, surmounted by uh, a light fixture. On the side, you have the rosary, an actual rosary, and if you pull that rosary, the image of the Virgin lights up, and you get grace by pulling on the rosary cord. Uh, these works have, of course, Flavin's wit, Flavin, the uh, former Catholic uh, altar boy, and you see a drawing of um, the Pope uh, brand East New York Shrine in the drawing on the right at the bottom left. Seems to me Flavin is already working away from Duchamp from a kind of use of the ready-made to make a high formal sculpture in the icons where he puts these lamps on these masonite supports, via crucis alluding to the passion of Christ the slant of that bulb is mimicking the slant of Christ's cross as he carried it down the Via Della Rosa. And then isolating that object, that ready-made, from the support, putting it on the wall in the diagonal of May, 
dedicated, of course, to Brancusi, making space, making place, um, using the um, industrial object to make place. It seems to me that they're thinking in not dissimilar terms, yielding very different results. The interest in seriality and repetition. So Carl is, is not alone, it seems to me, in his generation of people who are trying to think about what the ready-made object tradition would mean for them and how to transmute that into something more aesthetically um, powerful and contemporary. Now, the turn against Duchamp becomes particularly enunciated in the 70s, um, where Carl really moves away from or becomes critical of Duchamp, and the discussion of the exquisiteness becomes, in fact, a denunciation of the, as he says, artness and gentility and the refinement of it all. It's salon art. And we have to think about how Duchamp's career really, uh, how he became canonized in that period, editioned. It had become salon art. And how he needs to distinguish his procedure from the Duchamp ready-made procedure. The fact that Duchamp will show a single uh, ready-made, and that that ready-made, for all its indifference, has a lot to it visually. It, it's relatively complicated. The Andre Carl's units tend to be uninteresting as things, and that allows them to be deployed um, by the artist. And he says, I've almost never used a single bale of hay. That, to me, is not a work of art. The urinal is not a work of art. Quite a, quite a statement. Perhaps to Duchamp, but the relationship between 12, 30, or 50 bales of hay or plates, the will to make combinations like that, that to me is the desire of art. So in that text, he's really, really distinguishing um, his distance from the ready-made tradition. As we know, Carl is a co-founder of the Art Workers Coalition in 69 with artists like Hans Hacke and, and the critic John Peralt. And uh, Mark had alluded to Carl's interest in the writings of Marx and the Marxist critique of the commodity fetish. And in an essay that Carl published in the magazine Art Right in 75, Carl, it's called Against Duchamp, and Carl says the fault of the Duchamp ready-made is that it idealizes an industrial product by severing its origins in working class craft and claiming it as a trophy of capitalist cunning. The ready-made is industrial project, product as pure exchange value. Um, Smithson, by the way, described Duchamp as the spiritualist of Woolworths. So there, there's, I think, a great sympathy uh, between Carl and Robert Smithson in their um, uh, skepticism about Duchamp and about the ready-made. So Carl seems to be saying, you know, Duchamp is taking this ready-made and he's turning it into uh, exchange value, which is a dematerialization, isn't it? That it can be traded uh, monetarily um, on the market. So we've moved from Carl saying in 62, this is a great sculptor, Duchamp, although his stuff is a bit too pretty, a bit too exquisite, to saying, uh, I'm working very differently. I'm using a, a repeated use of industrial units or uh, process units, in the case of the hay, to make a sculpture, to critiquing it in a kind of Marxist terms. Now, of course, Carl's work would also be attacked in such terms, and not from intelligent or, or, uh, or critical uh, left-wing uh, left artists, uh, not by intellectuals, but by the, uh, the London tabloids. And you, some of you know about this, as it was called the Bricks Affair. In 1976, the Tate bought equivalent number eight, one of the uh, eight equivalent sculptures. Um, and, of course, uh, this became one of those uh, fake scandals that are now, of course, so common in, in, in public life. Um, and uh, this particular uh, newspaper, this 
uh, I should say, very conservative tabloid, the Daily Mirror, um, uh, actually hired bricklayers uh, to make their own brick sculptures, um, spelling words like art and so on, and trying to impute that there's a fraudulence uh, to the work, um, and raising the kinds of questions that had been raised about Duchamp, about the ready-made, is this art? Um, and, uh, and what is it for this, these, these industrial units to be uh, commodified, to be commercialized, to be traded, to become exchange value? So the kinds of criticism um, that was made against Duchamp is being made against André, uh, but from a very different direction. And of course, as Duchamp once remarked, the word anti annoys me a little, because whether you are anti or for, it's two sides of the same thing. And that is to say, to be against Duchamp is nevertheless to be interested in Duchamp, to be engaged with Duchamp. And we feel that in the Dada forgeries. It seems to me the Dada forgeries are making explicit that interest, that engagement. I think it's important to think about the Dada forgeries with the bona fide sculpture in terms of the use of the found object. And the found object has a long history in modern art. Uh, for Carl, the found object is a, a way to make sculpture. He's interested in the qualities of materials, what it is to uh, put that piece of uh, metal inside this spiral piece of metal, what it is to put this, uh, sort of screw it into a piece of wood. He's interested in the matter of the found object. And so the daughter forgeries actually do have a relationship with the bona fide sculpture in that the bona fide sculpture, there's a lot of found objects in Carl's, um, the art that he will show. So to say they're absolutely opposed, Antinomous is not true. There's a kind of porosity between um, this interest in the found object. And of course, Carl uh, will go to a place, as Mark described, and will order plates. Those are more intentional, not found objects. But Carl has made many works that um, are found, um, like the sorts at the Listen Gallery. I don't know if the blue Eva Adamuses were found. We'd have to ask uh, Carl about that. But they're made of these very um, simple pieces of plastic. Um, these cheap sort of pieces of plastic, and it, of course, Carl turns it into something beautiful, into a, a real work of sculpture. It's also interesting to think about the three-vector model. Um, Carl has always thought about the relationship of the artist, um, the, the qualities of the materials, and the about, amount of resources. So the, the daughter forgeries are part of that continuity. These are found things, they're cheap, you know, making art with the least amount of uh, financial uh, 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 backing, if you will, um, is an idea that we see in the sorts and in the daughter forgeries, and it's the total opposite of the current tendency uh, of, of artists like Kuhn's and Hearst to see how much can we spend and how much fabrication can we uh, bring to the work of art. Um, it's the total opposite, although the three vector model certainly does apply to those artists too. And so now we're gonna look uh, before I close at some, some, some daughter forgeries again. The sign of immortality. A work that Donald Judd, I believe, bought. It's in Marfa. There's a great line in uh, the Gospels, and uh, a couple of the apostles repeat this line that Christ apparently said, and this is from Matthew 19.25, quote, Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Um, well, here, of course, the camel cigarette pass package is squeezing through this needle-like sculpture. And I think um, here we see uh, Carl's wit at play. Um, he's kind of literally um, turning a, a biblical injunction from Jesus' lips into um, a witty sculpture. I, I would see this with the Flavin uh, 
uh, rosary uh, cord uh, shrine. Um, but it seems to me, as I said earlier, that the Dada forgeries also have a kind of subjective dimension that, that a lot of the more formal sculpture will purge. And the camel uh, package reference, um, this is a page from Passport, which Carl has put the co uh, cover of a camel um, package in between a very famous quotation from the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley um, in his uh, essay in defense of poetry. The famous line is, poets are the legislators of the world. And Carl has fixed the camel package in the middle of that Shelley quotation. So the camel package is uh, found in Passport. It's throughout Passport. This is the side of a camel package on the left. And on the right, Sobranier cigarettes, um, a, a piece of uh, metallic paper. And of course, you can read this as Carl's great interest in, in materials, in, in, in uh, metallic uh, elemental materials. But of course, as Carl has said, these cigarette packages um, that he put into Passport mark uh, his wedding, a wedding lunch um, that Carl uh, had in that, that year, um, where people smoke cigarettes. And he affixed these cigarette packages, uh, camel packages, into um, Passport, which is a kind of marking of that year. So there's a personal element to the camel, um, the camel cigarette package, which somehow finds its way into uh, the sign of immortality. Jane? Yes? I, that's actually a, an error. OK, uh, good. Well, I'm about to sigh. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. It's, it, it's not every day that we get to give a paper and have um, an artist like Carl uh, correct our errors. I'm loving this. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> oh, good. OK. So the sigh of immortality. Thank you. Uh, this is a work um, that uh, might be called Echo. Um, Eche Omo, <laughs> uh, Eche Omo, as you know, is what Pontius Pilate in, in the Latin accounts uh, says when they present the flagellated Christ to the, the, the angry public. Eche Omo, here is the man. And Carl has made, contracted um, that into a, I don't know, an anagram. Now it says Echo. Um, and surmounted it on a, a found piece of metal, um, which, uh, you know, you could look at as a kind of anthropomorphic joke, as a big nose pitched against the wall, uh, eyes, glasses. You could read it in different ways, but of course we think of Andre as completely non-figurative. And here's a, fun, a kind of amused, amused anthropomorphism. You could look at it that way. The anagram, of course, is very Duchampian. We know the, the very famous L-H-O-O-Q, where Duchamp, of course, it's an anagram for l h o o q there is fire down below. Um, but as well, uh, look at, of course, Duchamp uh, disassociates the gender of Mona Lisa with a mustache and a little goatee. And uh, Andre's Dada forgeries have uh, that kind of humor. They channel the, the, the amusement about gender and sexuality. As I said, a kind of regressive humor. Um, and so in Bois d'Anton, I did look that up, and uh, it means the wood of uh, yesteryear. And I'd be curious how we came up with that title. Is, of course, as I said, it's a bad, uh, it's a bad daughter work. It's cheap materials. Um, it's as unexquisite as Carl is saying, the fountain is exquisite. Um, but like the fountain, there's an interest in the true, the whole, um, a kind of, uh, kind of erotic humor um, in this work. This is a funny little work um, called Pisa, named after the tower. It consists of two pieces of wood, found pieces of wood, one of which is cut at a slant, and what Carl has done is he mounted 
one on top of the other. He writes Pisa, he signs his name, and on the side of the vertical piece of wood is the impression stud. And of course, uh, it's a phallic metaphor. Um, uh, Carl has said that Priapus is down on the floor in his work Lever. Well, in this work, Priapus is always coming down. This, the top of it is always falling down. And uh, it's got that kind of wit um, embedded into a material form. Socratic love, uh, a, a sock put onto a stick. Of course, we know in the symposium uh, of, of uh, Plato, Socrates uh, pushes away the affections of Alcibiades. Um, and so it's a kind of uh, humorous look at that kind of platonic love. And of course, I think this is in this show here, the monument to contraception. Monuments tend to be big and monumental. Carl's monument is made of these cheap materials. It's small. Um, the disc, I think, could fall off. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's to contraception. And by the way, note the dates of these things. So these um, start to come back in the 80s, the late 80s and the 90s. So the kind of, there's a lacuna, and I might be wrong about this, but I've, I, I, there seems to be a lacuna through the 70s um, in making these things, and that they come back in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, the, uh, the loving soul. Here we have um, a found piece of, is it iron, with the text malleable, um, but of course, the malleability is ironic. There's no malleability. It's set, but it's set on a very malleable piece of metal below. Love is something uh, perhaps changing or enduring. And of course, the question of the signature. Duchamp very famously signed the fountain with the fake signature, the invented artist, Armut. In, uh, as I said before, the daughter forgeries, they are signed by Andre with his bona fide signature, something he doesn't do in the other works, um, causing us to, uh, I don't know, it's a troping of the, the ready-made itself, and it's dismantling of the author. Here, the author is dismantled by uh, uh, confessing he's the author of this much lesser thing. This was exhibited at Julian Preto, the maze and snares of minimalism, um, made of the uh, rims of, of pedestals. And of course, minimal art we think of as the art that abandons the pedestal. That's what it's supposed to do. It brings sculpture to the floor, the Judd box, the Andre uh, floor plane, um, and so on. And here, the pedestal now becomes part of the sculpture, but discarded pedestals, the pedestals that minimalism discarded, now making up the sculpture, um, a kind of house of cards that could easily fall apart, um, rather fragile, um, and uh, a work that he calls the maze and snares of minimalism, minimalism as a kind of trap. Um, is it a trap for the artist who becomes called a minimalist? None of them liked the, the word. Um, is it a trap for people like us, the scholars and, and fans, who become um, entrapped into this uh, tendency? And one last work, which points back to the first image that uh, Mark showed, of course, of the Fisher Gallery, uh, Carl's first show in Europe, um, and the work La Terre du Pays, the, the land, the, the earth that has been fooled, that has been duped, where you have a kind of Andrian plate but with a, an upside down um, uh, wooden a foot, cheap, discarded. Um, what does that mean? Is, is the earth, uh, you know, in, in the classic sculpture, uh, the earth knows that we're standing on the plates. And here, the earth is fooled. It's not a person. Um, it's, it's just a crummy uh, kind of uh, found object upside down. A work that absolutely inverts the terms of Andre's sort of bona fide sculpture, um, just absolutely turned upside down. The earth is duped and gravity is duped. So the path of Duchamp um, might lead to a minor art, um, but a rather interesting one that from which one can look at the rest of the project of Carl Andre. 
And the path of Brancusi, of course, leads to a sculpture of place, of a body in a place, a revolutionary sculpture, as I called it, a sculpture that changes everything. So that's what I have to say. So, um, thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, well, thank you all for your presentations. Thank you, Linda, too, for yesterday. Um, I'm, my, my, my brain is, 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 is vibrating with questions, so um, I don't know how to start. Um, I, I, I do feel the urge to connect the, um, the two bodies of work that you have um, examined, uh, on the one hand, uh, Professor Godfrey, um, with this, I guess, open list of artworks, of contemporary artworks by uh, younger generations who have uh, referenced, criticized, or uh, paid homage to Carl Andre in, um, in the recent decades. And on the other hand, this um, unofficial, um, precariously analyzed uh, body of works of data forgeries and recently discovered. The one uh, thing that emerged in, in, in my notes uh, as I was listening to uh, Professor Godfrey's presentation and then uh, Professor Myers is some sort of diagram uh, that relates to uh, the video we saw Chinatown uh, by Lucy Raven. And um, this diagram, in a way, may allow us to uh, connect these two economies um, at work in the data forgeries and the bona fide. And I, I really appreciate your, your, your term for the, for the, uh, the main or other uh, or best known body of works by Carl André. Uh, on the one hand, and we, we've been looking at this I think we, oh, with fascination at uh, these uh, um, copper plates being uh, fabricated. We have the uh, bona fide series, and on the other we have the Dal Forges. The bona fide series of body of works, um, I think, addresses very directly, um, and Carlandre has refer, uh, referred to it uh, with many terms, but maybe matter or materials are those, uh, uh, those terms that are. Um, I think strongest to, to refer to this. Um, this body of works refers to the use to the value of use, the use value um, of, of of things, and it connects with matter, and it connects with sculpture, um, with this bona fide body of works, and paradoxically, this main body of works um, is not signed. It it it, it carries as a certificate. And it's at the same time the signature work of Carl Andre. On the other hand, we have uh, this other body of works, the Dada Forgeries, that relates to exchange value, to fetishism of, of, uh, of, uh, of the merchandise, that is signed, physically inscribed, as a fetish by Carl Andre. And that is a known derivative, um, jokingly ref referring to its author. If we look at the bona fide body of works, we see it's, it's highly compositional. And there's barely any um, intervention on the material itself, except for the combination, whereas the data forgeries are assemblage-based. Um, and uh, there is a, a very clear manipulation of things, even an, uh, an aberrant manipulation of things. And 
this diagram I don't think is a, is a new discovery or anything like that, but it may allow us to see how in some cases, um, some of the cases that uh, Professor Godfrey has shown, artists are employing an economy that can be related to the data forgeries to reflect upon the main body of works of Carl Andre, his, his sculpture. I think Zoe Lena's case, where she's replacing the cement blocks by all these saturated of meaning dolls, um, could be a, one case, and you see doll parts in some of the data forgeries. Um, and um, at the same time, when you look at data forgeries, I have the feeling that in many cases, well, I mean, it's not my feeling, it's, it's, it's an evidence in some cases, um, they're derivative and they're uh, art referential. Balzac could be an example. Um, the um, um, uh, Ma uh, Marjit Ondormi, um, this, this work about the Brancusian um, lying head, uh, represented in, in Carl's data forgery uh, by a tennis ball. Uh, I think that the, the, the references are, are, are various and, and, and revealing of a certain economy of citation operating in Carl's work about art, and then perhaps a similar economy of citation in the work of this artist toward Carl Landry. So, speaking about citation and derivation um, and how the forgeries may complete and anticipate um, the uh, contemporary and, and visionary energy of Carl Andre's work. I would, I would leave the question to both of you to address how on the one hand there's derivation in, in the data forgeries body of works and how the data forgeries could be uh, a precursor of the way artists have reflected upon Carl Andre's work. That would be my very simple and uh, <laughs> uh, not elaborate question. So either of you, please. Take it as you, um, you know, I don't see it that way. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, yes, because the data forgeries are, are unknown, mm -hmm. except until this show. It seems to me that the operations uh, in Zoe and some of the artists Mark was showing were to take the really iconic work and to do something with that, mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily irreverently. I don't. I don't think they have the wit of Carl's. Uh, oftentimes of Carl's data forgeries. I think they're, this is one of the standard classic vocabularies of, of post-war contemporary art. And uh, they are enlisting this uh, to do something different uh, for, for their own subject matter. And, and not, and it's not, as you said, I think what Zoe does with the doll is not about wit and it's, it's not about the combinations of language and then two objects that you see in the data forgeries. Um, so, but I wonder if I could ask a couple of questions about them. Um, one is, do you, do you think that there's uh, more French titling in the data forgeries than in the other body of work? Certainly in, in the examples you showed, there's a lot of French titling. Oh, yes. And, what, and what's that all about? <laughs> I, th I think it's Carl's uh, wit, and I think that um, <laughs> Carl's esprit. Um, but. Um, the way in that early uh, dialogue where he's sort of talking about uh, Duchamp's ready-made as exquisite, his wonderful, his exquisite taste, um, that in a sense Frenchness has come to signify a kind of exquisiteness. Um, and so then that would be, um, um, he's sort of Frenchifying th this, this French art in a kind of ironical way. I think, I think they are ludic about the ludic. You know, they are taking a step back and looking at um, the operations in the data from a kind of a bemused dif distance. And that by titling them these kind of irreverently French titles, he's both channeling the, the spirit, but also, in a sense, um, tweaking it, too. And the other thing I just want to ask is, I understand what you're saying, that they don't, the data forgeries, because they were never really shown, don't have a reception of their own. But, I mean, I wonder whether, they themselves are made not just in relation to Duchamp and Dada, but in relation to what else is going on in 1960s or 1980s art. For instance, people like Samaras and Wesselman in the 60s, or even, I mean, just I'm thinking this because I saw the Goba show yesterday. Um, um, of course, it's incredibly different, witty versus very poignant, mm -hmm. but some of the forms 
uh, in some of the Dada forgeries and maybe close to the kind of works that I think in the 80s in the Paula Cooper Gallery again mm. are associated with a younger generation of sculptors. Mm. So I wonder what the in to ask you, but cars in the room, it's like what the impetus is for these waves of work. Is it also just Carl looking at recent things going on around him? I think we'd have to ask Carl that question, but I will, I will, I will say to you, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Patrick. There's one great secret about the God of Fortress. They were intended to be jokes, <laughs> and if they're not funny. It's tragic. Right. <laughs> Can I come in at that point? Because um, um, two things. One was I was Hamilton's assistant when I first came to New York for his Guggenheim show. And he was also working with Kiniston on the Philadelphia show at the same time. So I was a little bit immersed in Duchampian things. Um, and I, I was very confused. I was trying to set up a, a, a dialogue between, which I failed to do, between Hamilton and Jasper Johns on Duchamp, which I, I would, you know, just love to have heard for myself, never mind have written up. And I went with Richard down to uh, uh, John's uh, bank and um, I was quite amazed by it all, and I, I was following the Richard Serra lead piece, and all of a sudden, Johns came, put his arm around my shoulder, and said, Linda, do you know where this leads? This leads to my vaults. And do you know what's in my vaults? It's my prints. They're my banknotes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I felt that... Uh, I was sort of beginning to kind of understand what was really, because I was a terribly English girl, very, very confused by New York and the values of what was going on. The other thing is, to go back to my kind of Englishness, um, there's a lot in the internet now and quite a kind of underground movement. Uh, the guy, I can't remember his name for the life of me, but he was Damien Hurst's art history teacher in Leeds. He's been working for years on Duchamp, and basically his thesis is that Duchamp didn't do the urinal, that the urinal was produced in 1917 by an Austrian baroness, Elsa von Honolulu, and at this point it was because she was so upset about uh, the USA joining the war on the Allies' side against Germany, and that this is the reason for, for the urinal piece. It wasn't made by Duchamp at all, and that Duchamp really enjoyed this kind of forgery of the Duchamp. Um, and the, there's masses, as I say, on the internet. Do look it up for yourself. But that was the, the two stories that were going through my head, listening to the wonderful paper, it's which very I, interesting, I, I enjoyed enormously. You know, Mark, I, I, think, I think the way Carl is working with these things is, is for a long time, Carl would take walks. I don't know if, if you're still doing that in the way that you did, but, and you would scavenge, didn't you? You'd find these things and, and you'd sort of collect them and think, well, what can I do to make something out of these? So I don't, you know, at one point I did actually, Mark, put up a gober uh, foot, one of those beautiful, uh, troubling foots, legs coming out of a wall next to this work, but I removed it because um, I don't think that that's the way he's working. Um. Um, James, um, I think there's something really interesting um, in in speaking about the the. I mean, because I'm I'm totally ready to withdraw the uh, the, the term citation. Um, from what I said before, but there is certainly some sort of resonance, and um, I would like you, you both, uh, and I, I, I would like to involve also Linda in this because I think uh, 
both uh, you and Linda have been uh, eyewitnesses to very specific periods that um, we've been referring to. Um, I think in, in, in Mark's uh, presentation, the, there was a, a, um, a strong um, and repetitive reference to AIDS and uh, the way, uh, at least earlier that, was um, addressing some issues related to the AIDS crisis um, in, in New York. And um, I couldn't help thinking that Carl was uh, showing uh, some of his other forgeries at Julian Preto Gallery in New York and that Julian Preto uh, was a victim of AIDS uh, in 1995. And uh, somehow there is a connection there. Um, and on the other hand, uh, I, I would change the word citation by resonance. And um, I think Michael was also clear by when saying that it is not very um, established, and it's maybe you know, not your intention to establish whether these were actual you know, references that whether um, in, in, in many cases there's a, an explicit reference or just a resonance or just a, a similarity or, um, or taking on a problem that goes beyond the individual works of Carl Andre or uh, the artists in question. So speaking about reference and resonance and uh, periods and also being a witness, Linda, you were there uh, in the late 60s and 70s, seeing how the first important works of Carl Andre had an impact in the art community in Europe. So I would like the three of you to just uh, elaborate as you want on this, on this topic. <laughs> well, I, I actually was thinking about a question. It, it's not exactly what you're asking me, but that Mark posed about death and, and the fact that these artists are thinking about the epidemic and respect to Carl's work and that death is sort of a theme in the sculpture in that period in the 90s. And um, Carl has spoken quite a bit about sculpture and death. It's very much part of um, his program from the start. If you look at um, poems like Chain, Tomb, Ode or Essay on Sculpture, those terrific early poems where uh, words like tomb and uh, uh, Tumulus and sort of sculpture is always, it seems to me, um, related to death uh, in, in Carl's conception. And, and we have a section in the book Cuts called Sculpture and Death. Um, uh, one of Carl's uh, uh, arguments about his work is that it's Neolithic sculpture and, uh, you know, modern Neolithic sculpture and Neolithic sculpture, steely tombs, it's sort of channeling that legacy. So it's kind of interesting that you're showing us um, contemporary practices that somehow find in the, in the floor and in the repetition the idiom that, that Carl develops, um, a kind of vehicle for thinking, for, for wor thinking about death in sculpture. That's exactly it. I mean, it, it's people who are drawing out things that are implicit, maybe not as often recognized or written about, but find it in the work because it's sort of there in the mm. work already. Mm. Linda, maybe you would like to say something about uh, the early years and perhaps... Well, I was, uh, uh, for those people who weren't here yesterday, what I was particularly talking about was that triangle in Northern Europe mm. uh, between um, Cologne and Dusseldorf, Amsterdam and Ghent, Brussels. And... Um, Certainly, I knew that most of the galleries that were bringing over American and British artists, most of the small museums who were beginning to do one-person exhibitions with the, that generation of artists, were all within that triangle. That's where the action was. Um, and it also struck me from a, a, a satellite picture that it's by far the brightest part of the whole of Europe. Uh, the density of industry I I in that area. And, of course, that just led me to realise that uh, at the end of the Second World War, that's where most of the major bombing of cities and the street fighting took place and the curators and the um, dealers of that period were mostly born in the late 1930s and were small children at the end of the Second World War. So they grew up feeling we're not Germans like the Nazis, we were just small children. You know, by the time we get there, we'll be able to shake a lot of this off. 
and of course they just weren't able to. When I looked at all the suitcases that Mark showed us today, I mean, I was immediately thinking of those Auschwitz photographs, not the AIDS, um, of the suitcases, and it just echoes through one's head, however much one might have fallen in love with the German over the years. There's, there's something else I wanted to ask James, which is just about the Dada forgeries, which isn't to do necessarily with whether they're responding to something or whether they have contemporary or prior, but just about the, the impulse in an artist's practice to have another side of your practice that maybe is hidden, maybe is sort of disconnected to what you do or what you're known for, and whether you, where else you see it. I was trying to, as you were talking, I was trying to think, is this similar to like Ellsworth Kelly drawing flowers while mm. making grids or, um, or, or, I don't know, I mean, in the last Whitney Biennial there was these sketchbooks by Alan Sakula that were also sort of surprising. Do you, I mean, if you could talk a bit more about what that's about, that desire to do something else. Gosh, I, I mean, I think, I think we'd have to ask Carl that question. Um, or or Van Brancusi taking photographs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's more like a different... I don't, it, Would you it, think it's a, it's six, a slightly it a secret? Different. It's almost that, you know, if the thing that you do is, um, is known for seriousness, a compositionality, um, industrial forms, materials matter, but also for Carl, a lot of the, a lot of the works aren't, as far as I understand it, necessarily hand placed by him. I mean, other people can lay out the works. Um, what it means almost to have a part of your practice that's concealed, which is about something very improvisational, something to do with like, only you could put that thing on that thing and give it that title. Mm. And that's something that's just about you, which is, it's a nice, I can see that as an artist, there's many things that you want to do that are different. Like his poetry, I would say. Yeah. Like, what you seem to have had faces, like the face where you were doing poetry for a long time, and then um, later on we encountered those postcards that you were sending to friends. It seems to me natural that as an artist, you were having different periods of engagement on different things. So the Dada Fogeries didn't shock me more than it intrigued me. Um, from, our, from our perspective, they didn't seem totally unusual, but that they were, a, they were another form of making a poem, in a way. I still think, well, they were intended to be jokes. Yeah. <laughs> it was your stand-up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> sit down comedy. Still, that, that is interesting to have a part of one's practice which is light relief, which is jokey. It's sort of, I'm just trying to think where else that is than other artists, whether they're connected or not. But I also wanted to ask in terms of installation, sorry to... Because... I, I want to just say, I mean, I think you're raising something about that they're sort of private. I mean, they are um, a, sort of private little things, jokes, but they were jokes among friends. Um, Mementos, I believe, that Carl would give to friends, people who would work with him. Um, there, there's a kind of sociality uh, to these things um, that, you know, they're not public enunciations. But in the installation here, it's amazing that they're downstairs. And that's a real dynamic of the, of the show, that you've got the bona fide work upstairs, and then you go downstairs. Well, that is more logistical. Good um, work. <laughs> Well, in part because it's the darkest the rooms we can get at DIA. Nonetheless, in, in the other iterations of this show, it's going to be really interesting to see <laughs> how, how they go. you... Yeah. Because it, when you don't have an upsize downstairs in LA or wherever the, else the show's in, not LA, I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, it's going there. But, you know, when it's on one floor, what, what do you do to make a differentiation? Do you interweave them or... It's a nice challenge to... Yes. You have, to, you have to come see to Madrid and You have Berlin. to come to see in Madrid. Uh, it's true that there's a symbolic aspect to the fact that the, the lower ground floor contains this body of works that is more secret, 
more intimate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the texture of the private joke is, is very present. Uh, mm -hmm. In, uh, for instance, a Monument to Contraception, you wonder, okay, there must be some, some story behind this that we're, we're not meant to know. But do you and remember we, we've once considered the Palermo room? Mm -hmm. And um, it was for a long time we were debating whether that room would allow us to have the data forgeries. We had a challenge that we w didn't want to cover them. We didn't want to put them in vitrines and make them into these precious objects. Mm -hmm. And we wanted people to have the direct view of them without being able to put them in their pockets. So th there are all these considerations that led mm -hmm. us downstairs. And mm -hmm. eventually we felt, I feel, I mean, I can speak for all of us, mm -hmm. uh, we felt that it was the right room mm -hmm. for it. Um, but yes, it, it is true that separating them from physically and like walking mm -hmm. distance from the other work sort of suggests us there's some sort of secret more mm -hmm. than than we really wanted mm. to intend. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Just to add a note to what Yasmil is saying, I, I also think that something very important for us, and which I think it relates to Carl's genius and, and, and challenging personality, and this must be like the revolutionary aspect of the regressive uh, Dada Fortress, which is that he insists, okay, these are, these are um, artworks as much as a joke is a sentence. You know, um, these artworks don't have the full status of artworks, and therefore, mixing them or putting them on the same level could create a misunderstanding. I think there's something really provoking in the fact that they are not exactly artworks that Karl Landry has treated them totally differently um, throughout his career. And that's a, that's a beautiful gesture that we mm -hmm. kind of wanted to, pres to preserve by mixing the, the forgery with other documents or mm -hmm. things that, you know, I mean, I think Gianfranco Gorgoni's photographs are incredibly inter interesting, but we, we cannot mix them with, with the actual sculptures or, or, I mean, or, or some of the ephemera are, are terribly compelling and, and you know, I'm, I think they're, they're um, great objects, mm -hmm. but there's something specific about each of these objects and the status that we wanted to preserve. Um, perhaps we can move the microphone a little bit. I see there was one question on the right. Thank you. I'm Lytle Shaw. Uh, my question has to do with poetry. Uh, and I noticed uh, when James Meyer uh, cited Shelley, he didn't uh, cite the line, which is that they're the unacknowledged oh, legislators of the world. And I want to talk about the acknowledgement of poetry, um, which is, so the, the question is, um, you gave a three-part account of the standard narrative that begins with shape and moves to structure and then mm. goes to place. Poetry has an account of a place too, and uh, you know, in all of the, well, in both of the papers, there are, there are extremely detailed accounts of the kind of um, career insights of artists at various months and various years, and that's one of the features that's almost entirely lacking interdisciplinarily when art historians talk about Andre's relation to poetry, which is to say, what did the field of poetry actually look like in the late 50s and early 60s. And now he cites Stein and Pound, but there's an extraordinarily articulated uh, discourse of the poetics of place that comes out of Water Clo uh, Closet Williams, as he talks about, but also out of Charles Olson and Larry mm. Eigner and many others. Mm. And so my question is, if, if that's one standard narration that you want to push up against, what would happen to his account of place if you were to begin to talk about the, poet, uh, the poetry materials that were, were uh, available at that moment and would need to be accounted for in, a kind of, in the same kind of minute positioning narrative that is so common in art history, but is almost never uh, uh, attempted when art history strays over and begins to deal with the literary history that in this case could certainly be one of its materials. Mm. I was running the bookshop at the ICA, um, 69, 71. And I, I was uh, very conscious, because I w went on later to work with uh, Germano Gillant and curate the show of the book as artwork for him. Um, but because the ICA had a strong literary tradition, I was extremely interested in the uh, small presses. And we were importing a lot of stuff from California at that time, the great pair pamphlets and things like this which seems to me did have a very strong impact, not so much the great poetry, but the sort of sense of the small publications and the importance of the small publications 
by the poets themselves. I don't know whether that cuts across what you're talking about. But. Well, I just think there were articulate positions that had been developed in the world of poetry and that were historically available by the late 1950s and should be in any account of any persuasive account of what it meant to claim place as a category. Yes, um, I, I would add that uh, we have documents that show that Carl was involved in experimental poetry writing since the early 50s. Uh, his days in Andover. So um, maybe James, uh, you, you, you wrote this uh, very revealing um, essay, uh, Calendar Writer, as an introduction to, to cuts, and perhaps you, you may have some comments to this. Uh... Well, but that, that, that's really about Carl's prose. Okay. And uh, I, I really um, felt that the discussion of poetry was, uh, was too vast for what we were doing in cuts, which was about Carl's prose. But you did come up with a, a, a terminology that I found really useful afterwards um, to, because we, you know, um, the citations that occur also in the artworks uh, are very interesting on, on Carl's treatment uh, of text. And uh, in, in Katz, there's uh, this division between planes, letters, statements. Um, mm. I don't remember very well, but the, this concept of planes, for instance, I think you were very clear about mm. the way it applies and how these planes contain statements that are Carl's prose, uh, some of the very uh, mm. famous aphorisms or declarations mm. of intent mm. are, are, are laid uh, out in, in planes. Mm. So I think that there's a, there's a moment of, of uh, intersection. But it's not clear to me um, if you could perhaps elaborate what you mean by the narrative of poetry and place, because I'm not sure we're all familiar with the um, poetical tradition that you're mm. marshalling and wanting to then compare to a sculptural narrative. Could you perhaps elaborate on that for us? Well, Williams and Patterson, Olson and Maximus, Eigner throughout his entire career. Um, so you're talking about William Carlos William in a poem like Patterson, talking about place within a poetical... But it's not just a thematic discussion right. of place. It's formally enacted, too, in some ways that would bear close comparison mm. with many of the features of Carl Andre's poetry. Mm. In other words, it's not just a kind of, you know, poems that reference sure. places tradition. Sure. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it could be potentially rich. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, we, perhaps we can ask Carl, um, if, if, yeah. if you allow me to translate your question into, Carl, um, would you say that your idea of place was influenced by some readings of poetry that in other places, I think you have acknowledged as, as being influential, like uh, Carlos Williams uh, Patterson or, or other works, whereas your idea of place influenced also by language and poetry. Uh, my feeling is that the feeling of place occurred first. I mean, I, I wrote my first poem, Conscious Poem, when I was eight years old, and it was about Outside of my bedroom window, there were two large cherry trees. And one April morning, I woke up and looked out, and there was snow falling. But it, it, not possible. And I looked out, and it was the petals of the cherry blossoms. Um, that's an experience of that's place. That's how poetry gets to be done. It's an experience of place. Well, it's more complicated than that. There was, certainly was a place, but there was a, a physical event, and there was the perception of that event, and the... I mean, poetry, it, it's subjective and objective. I mean, it's... And, uh, all art aspires the condition of music, that's all I'll say. Maybe. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this pr presentation today. It's been, I, I'm going to be awake all night, I know. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to get back to something that, that Carl mentioned earlier, which has been on my mind all these weeks that I've been going through this installation. And he said, if this stuff, specifically the, 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 the data forgeries, which to me are the, are the heartbeat of this whole enterprise here, very importantly, and the, and the poetry, and they're connected, and, and that's what I wanted to address. He mentioned if they weren't funny, they'd be tragic. And, and as the days have progressed, I've, I've come to a realization that one of the beauties, and I'm gonna, I, I use the word beauty very, very seldom, one of the beauties of the show, the exhibit 
is that it is non-tragic. It doesn't have a tragic uh, element in it. And when we go to the poems, and, and particularly the, uh, the Kennedy assassination, and the uh, John Brown, uh, yeah, now these are, these are horrible events, but uh, they don't come across in the tragic mode. And, and, and I think the reason for that is very, very related to the, the, the idea of the ready-made, the idea of the appropriation. Because, of, and I've talked about this before, that what we're dealing with, that Duchamp dealt with and what Carl has dealt with here, are objects that have outlived their utility. And they weren't utility, they, they, they had functions. And, and they were designed with the human brain making them in, a, in, a, in that fashion. And, and they've outlived that, and, and it uh, becomes a reutilization when an artist sees them and transforms them, recreates them into a new language. And, and now, this brings us to, the, to the, the, the element that hasn't really been discussed much, collage. And, uh, and, and, and the collage element is very strong in the poetry. Now, what's taken out? It, it, if we go back to this notion of, of appropriation, uh, I see the poems as, as um, uh, the words, as ready-mades from a language that is perhaps no longer vital. Just as, you know, Gertrude Stein said, you know, when she said a rose is a rose is a rose, she was recreating uh, the rose in a, new, in a new language, and she was. So that element of, of the language comes into play here. And by taking elements from the old language, the, the used language, so to speak, uh, they, they are placed in a collage modality where the syntax is gone. And, 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 and I think what's important in reading those poems, especially the, the, the ones that have mo monumentally, potentially uh, horrible uh, circumstances is that without the syntax you avoid the rhetoric that creates that emotionalism and the emotionalism isn't there and and that what is what gives Carl's work for me a kind of a classical modality mm -hmm. it's the lack of the tragic well and, and uh, I, I would say that um, without uh, without an intention to um, to overlook the the tragic but what you're saying I think it's, it's, it's useful to articulate um, a response to, to his question, uh, to the first question we had, um, because it's true that maybe the poetry has, uh, or can stand as a keystone for assemblage and collage and appropriation economies in, in, in Karl's practice, but also um, idea, the development of early ideas of place and, and specificity to um, the material, the, the, the material uh, qualities also of the of 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 the source text recounted uh, like reconfigured in, in in numerical series or or shapes, etc. Can I ask everyone? Do we take Duchamp too seriously? <laughs> yes, um, in the back of the. Oh. Back of the room. Rob. There's what? another one, yes. Oh, there are two questions. Okay. Is that too sharp? Are you saying it too seriously too? Yeah. Hey, no, 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 no. What's the matter with these people? Um, I would kick myself if I uh, didn't grab this opportunity to ask for a, an elaboration on art aspiring to the condition of music, which is a beautifully simple and incredibly open-ended statement. And since you let it fly out like a pearl. Well, I wish I had originated, but I didn't. But I would love to know. So would I. What? I'd love to know more of what you think about it. I've spent a lifetime trying to trace that down. And you can't get it. It's the most sort of from heaven. What kind of music do you listen to? What kind of music do you listen to? Any kind you want. <laughs> 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 it's a kind of music. 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 It's
student. Of, I'm not a great student of, of anything. I find the thing and I become obsessed with it. And there are just a few things I've been obsessed with in my life. I thought the rest I'm totally ignorant of. So. Rob? That's Rob. One last question. Yes. Uh, well, this is perhaps a very simple question, uh, but in spirit of the wit of uh, the forms of Don Mark. I, I wonder if, in the kind of spirit of word, wordplay, I mean, I've always loved the word forge because it has this connotation of um, duplicity, but it also is a very traditional sculptural um, strategy you know, mm -hmm. that, that Davis and Blacksmiths. I wonder that's what it is to be patient with these two lines of work. Yeah, good question. Somebody once said, simplicity is something that you should strive for, but you should never attain. <laughs> Retain or attain? Attain. Attain. Well, with that, I talked about that. <laughs> Let me just say one thing. Um, since Sharon Lockhart is here honoring uh, us uh, with her visit to the Abeacon, um, I just want to remind you that Tuesday, um, Tuesday? In Chelsea. in Chelsea, Sharon will be giving an artist, an arti uh, an artist lecture about Franz Erhard Walter. And uh, we invite you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> This is my yeah. This is this is my crazy mind. This is me. This is me as I'm blushing names uh, about uh, Steve Paxton. So uh, please join us for that uh, event. We'll be very very happy to have you again in Chelsea. And thank you so much for being here. Um, have a good Sunday evening. Thank you. Thank you.